Good morning, everyone, and welcome um, to these uh, webcast outreach events jointly organized by EFRAG and the IASB on uh, the uh, IASB discussion paper, Business Combination Disclosures, Goodwill and Impairment. We are very pleased uh, to organize this event, which is the first of a series of events dedicated dedicated to the Goodwill discussion paper uh, that will keep us busy uh, during the next, I would say, six weeks. Uh, we are uh, also pleased to have received a good number of re registrants for this event. Uh, we hope and intend to replicate the success of the PFS outreach plan uh, jointly with the IASB uh, and, uh, and to get good uh, input for our uh, co final comment letter and, uh, uh, and the same, I think, for the IASB. So uh, I will leave the floor now to uh, Martin Edelman, uh, ISB member, for his introductory remark on the ISB project on Goodwill. And after I will provide few remarks on EFRAG preliminary positions and questions to constituents that are in our draft comment letter, before handing over to Olivier Scherere, who will be moderating the panel discussion. Martin, you have the floor. Okay, thank you, Kira. And also, good morning from my side, and thank you for attending this joint EFRAG and ISP outreach event to discuss our discussion paper, Business Combination, Disclosure, Goodwill, and Impairment. And before I start, I let me mention to you that, as always, any views I and Tim express today are our own views and may not necessarily be shared by the rest of the IASP. So this is a very important set of proposals for the IISB, and investors are really keen to receive better information about acquisitions, both at the time that the acquisitions are made and to understand especially then the subsequent performance of this business combination and acquisition. As many of you know, the zoning question of subsequent accounting for goodwill is one that has been of interest for many years and tends to give rise to really polarized opinions. Questions have also been raised about the effectiveness of and the complexity of the impairment testing for goodwill and also the timeliness of the recognition of the impairment. I really encourage people to respond to this discussion paper. And then slide number five. To start with, slide number five provides an overview of our project on goodwill and impairment. The ISP started this after the post-implementation review, which is some years already passed. And the deadline for submitting the comment letters has been extended to end of December 2020 because of the strain the coronavirus pandemic is placing to stakeholders. The objective of the project is to improve the information that companies provide to users at a reasonable cost about the business that companies buy. The ISP hopes to help users hold management to account for those acquisition decisions. The discussion paper contains a number of specific questions for stakeholders. The ISP is particularly interested in hearing from stakeholders on how useful and feasible they think the new disclosure ideas are, as well as whether they have any new evidence for arguments on the best way to account for goodwill. That is really, should we go back to amortization, yes or no? Slide number six summarizes the ISP preliminary views that are presented in the discussion paper. These preliminary views cover three main areas, as you see on this slide and reflected concerns the ISP heard from stakeholders. The first area relates to disclosure. The ISP preliminary view is that it should propose to require companies to disclose information about business combinations performed after the acquisition. And that was one of the main, I think, results from the post-implementation review. We had two main issues. That was uh, users told us that they don't have sufficient information about the successfulness of the business acquisition. And the second big point was, okay, the effectiveness of the impairment test. 
And the second area, as I said, relates to improving the account for goodwill. The ISB explored whether it could make the impairment test more effective, but its preliminary view is that it is not feasible to improve the test significantly at a reasonable cost. The ISP then considered whether to propose reintroducing amortization, and the ISP preliminary view is that it should not do so because there is not a compelling evidence that doing so would significantly improve financial reporting. As you maybe know, mind this board decision was really split. There were six people saying, okay, we should introduce, reintroduce amortization, but the majority said, okay, there is not sufficient evidence to do so. Finally, the ISP explored some possible simplifications that would reduce the cost of performing the impairment test by removing the, removing the requirements to perform the test annually and amending how value is used in, as how value in use is estimated. The third and final area relates to some other topics. The ISP preliminary views is that it should require companies to present total equity excluding goodwill on the balance sheet. The ISP also thinks it should retain the current approach of requiring companies to recognize identifiable, identifiable intangible assets separately from upon acquisitions, rather than subsume them of these intangible assets into the goodwill number. We will only be discussing selected topics from the discussion paper today. However, we have included a few slides in the appendix that cover the other topics from the discussion paper. It is perhaps just worth emphasizing here that the views of the discussion paper are preliminary. Depending on the feedback, comments that the IAB, ISB receives from outreach roundtables such as the one today and comment letters the ISB may decide to reconsider some or all of the preliminary views. Thanks, and that finalized my introduction. Thank you, Martin. Sedat, can I have the next slide, please? And uh, from EFRAG side, uh, goodwill is a relevant topic uh, in our research agenda already since a few years. From 2015 to 18, we have uh, issued a series of publications before the ISB started the project, and we are pleased to see that the discussion paper of of the ISB has also taken on board some detailed proposals of our discussion paper. So we are very much uh, linked and, and attached to this, uh, to this important topic. We issued our draft comment letter on the 29th of May and the comment period ends uh, the 30th of November. You can find also in our website a link to a survey with preparers. You have still time to participate. We are keen to get views from the preparers on uh, several aspects, including uh, operability of uh, uh, the proposed disclosures, but also other topics. In general terms, our letter supports the objective of the discussion paper and agrees that there is a problem with the information that users currently get about the goodwill and the performance of the acquisitions. Users say that the reported goodwill has limited relevance, for several reasons, including uh, the fact that conceptually goodwill is a mixture of different components and uh, the impairment test is affected by the so-called shielding effects and uh, the goodwill is not tested directly but indirectly. So it's tested at level of CGU. So this is from a high level point of view what uh, doesn't work in terms of goodwill accounting. Uh, EFRAG notes uh, uh, also, as Martin was saying, that uh, the proposals in the DP start from uh, the assumptions that it's not possible to develop a more efficient impairment test uh, and therefore addresses the issues mainly through disclosure. But we think that there is some room for improvement. That's why in uh, the detailed proposals that we will discuss today, we have also included without uh, engaging in major changes and abandoning the current model, we try to develop some detailed proposal that may help uh, to get some improvements in the uh, practice, how the test works in practices. We are consulting also on a number of other issues. 
including whether there is new evidence supporting the possible reintroduction of amortization. And Martin was saying how difficult it was already for the IESB to get uh, a view on this, and the board was very much divided. Well, we see the same also in our board and also from the preliminary feedback that we get from uh, our constituents. So this is a key point, and we really look for new evidences because from a conceptual point of view, it's really hard to see which of the two approaches is superior. So looking forward for the discussion because it will be helpful to shape our final uh, comment letters. And with these, uh, I will hand over to Olivier uh, to run and moderate the panel discussion. Thank you, Chiara. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am um, Olivier Scherer. I am a partner with PwC in France, and I am a member of the Technical Expert Group of IFRAG. So th during the next uh, two hours and 45 minutes, um, we will um, go through that topic in four parts. So the first part will deal with disclosures, then uh, a second part on how to improve and whether we can improve uh, the goodwill impairment testing. Uh, a third part on indicator only approach versus annual impairment test. And the last part, uh, should we go back to amortization or not? So for each part, uh, we will have a panel discussion. Uh, well, first we will have a presentation, more detailed presentation on, on the ISB's proposal, comments from uh, IFRAG, and then panel discussion. Uh, so for the panel discussion, we have um, uh, six members. Um, so we have Robert Brown. Robert is a member of the German Financial Reporting Enforcement Panel. Uh, we have Emanuele Flapini. Uh, Emanuele is a preparer um, and he is with Medio Banca. We have Javier uh, Hombrea. Uh, Javier is a user, financial analyst. Uh, we have Anne Jenny. Uh, Anne is a professor uh, at ESSEC in France. Um, Diane, and we have Diana, Nicolo Eva. Uh, Diana is a partner with ENY, and she is a member of the board of the IVSC. Um, to present the to the topics from the ISB's perspective, um, that will be presented by Tim Craig. Tim is a uh, uh, member of the technical staff of the ISB. And to present the views of the FRAG, we'll have Catherine uh, Schoenard. Uh, Catherine is a project director at FRAG and uh, Rasmus Sommer, um, who is uh, also uh, working with Catherine at EFRAG. Uh, with that said, I'm suggesting that uh, we move on to the next, uh, to the, our first topic on disclosures. Um, and I turn it to Tim. Thanks, Olivia. Uh, uh, Tim, just, just one word before we start, uh, one more word. Um, throughout the, the presentation, uh, there will be, you, you have two ways of interacting with, with us. Uh, the first way is by asking questions, and uh, normally you are, you, you are supposed to be able to, to do that by uh, a window that you have at the bottom left corner of your screen. Uh, and the other way is through putting questions that you will see throughout the presentations. Uh, and for which not only will you see the questions, but also uh, the answers that will be provided by, uh, by the participants. Um, uh, with that said, I think we can, we can move on. Of course, the, panel, the questions that we will ask, uh, feel free to ask them. Uh, they are anonymous, uh, so you won't, uh, others will not see who is asking the question, uh, but we will report what the questions are. Uh, to the panelists. Um, so, Tim, this is um, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Olivia. Uh, so, that if we could move on to the, the next slide, please. Thank you. 
Uh, so we'll now take a look at the first of the topics that we'll discuss today, which is the ISB's preliminary views on improving disclosures about acquisitions. One of the key messages that the ISB has heard from investors is that companies generally do not disclose sufficient information to allow investors to assess how well a business combination has performed post-acquisition. Investors want this information to hold management to account for its decisions to acquire those businesses. Most investors told us that the information is needed for stewardship purposes to help them, for example, determine whether they can trust management with future capital. Existing standards do not specifically require companies to disclose such information, and hence any information that's provided today is disclosed voluntarily. Therefore, the discussion paper explores whether to require companies to disclose information on the subsequent performance of business combinations. And the ISB's preliminary view is that it should require companies to disclose in the year of acquisition, firstly, the strategic rationale for the business combination. And the rationale would be a high-level statement that links the business combination to the entity's overall strategy. And that overall strategy may be set out elsewhere in the company's annual report, for example, in its management commentary. Secondly, the key objectives of the specific business combination, these being the more detailed aims that management intends to achieve as a result of the business combination. And thirdly, the metrics and targets that management will use to assess what extent those key objectives are being achieved. Then in subsequent periods, the company would disclose the business combination's actual performance based on those metrics to enable users of financial statements to assess to what extent the key objectives identified at the acquisition date are being achieved. So if we can uh, turn to the next slide, please. Uh, so what kind of information do companies need to disclose in the subsequent years? And this slide looks at that question. So there's a wide range of business combinations and they serve a wide range of purposes. So the ISB concluded that no single metric would be suitable for every business combination. Therefore, the ISB is exploring a management approach. In other words, the metrics disclosed would be those an entity's management uses internally to monitor whether they have met the objectives of the acquisition. Such measures could be operational or financial or a mixture of both. Because acquisitions can often involve large sums of money, the ISB presumes that most companies are monitoring their major acquisitions. But if management is not monitoring a business combination, the ISB believes that a company should disclose this fact rather than the ISB prescribe a minimum set of information to be disclosed. And when we say the information being used by management, what do we mean by that? The discussion paper proposes that we use the per perspective of a company's chief operating decision maker, which is a term that's used to identify the disclosures required for segment reporting under IFRS 8. Now, the main reason the ISB is suggesting using the chief operating decision maker as a threshold in this new context is so that companies disclose the most important information about the most important business combinations. A lower threshold might result in excessive and costly disclosures, particularly for companies that make many acquisitions. Now, one thing the ISB would like stakeholders' views on is whether using the chief operating decision maker as a threshold would lead companies to disclose all the material information that investors need about the business combinations they want to know about. The ISP is aware that some stakeholders have various concerns about providing this information. For example, what if the acquired business is integrated with an existing part of the business post-acquisition? The answer to this depends on how management is monitoring the success of the business combination. For example, the chief operating decision maker may be monitoring the performance of the business combination using information about the combined business rather than the acquired business in isolation. In that case, the company would disclose information on those metrics about the combined business that the chief operating decision maker is using. The principle here is to disclose the information that management uses internally to monitor the business combinations. The ISB is not expecting companies to create disclosures to satisfy the requirements, but to disclose the information that management are already using internally. Sometimes when we discuss the ISB's preliminary views on subsequent performance disclosure, the, the issue of integration is raised 
And it sometimes sounds like it prevents companies from monitoring the business combination, and that therefore, when integration occurs, management do not know how well a business combination is performing. However, when we have the opportunity to discuss this further with stakeholders, we often find that management are still monitoring the business combination in some manner and are aware of how well a business combination is performing, at least in the early years, which is what the ISB expected. The discussion paper discusses other concerns that the ISB has heard, so including whether the information is commercially sensitive and whether it's verifiable. And the ISB wants to explore these concerns with stakeholders and hopes stakeholders raising these issues will also help the ISB find ways to address them since, in the ISB's view, it's reasonable for users of financial statements to ask for companies to provide information that will help them understand better how a business combination is performing. In short, a, a plea to help us to work something out that works for preparers and helps investors, as this is an area that is important for investors. One final point to make on the subsequent performance disclosures is that some stakeholders have said that the ISB is asking for information of a type that should be included in the management commentary rather than financial statements, because, for example, it's strategic, it's management's view, analysing performance of part of the business, and it could involve non-GAAP measures. Nevertheless, the conceptual framework is not a barrier to including such information in financial statements. And investors have said that they're not getting enough information today on the subsequent performance of acquisitions, there being no or at least minimal requirements in IFRS to provide this information. And therefore, any information investors are getting today is being provided voluntarily by companies. In determining its preliminary view to propose including this as a disclosure requirement in the financial statements, rather than something that companies might volunteer to provide in their management commentaries, the ISB put weight on ensuring the information is made available to all investors. The ISB would like to hear from stakeholders who do think this information should be included in the management commentary. For example, whether they think companies can be encouraged to provide this information. OK, if we can move on to slide 11, please. There you go. So this slide summarises the ISB's preliminary views on some other targeted improvements to existing disclosures uh, included in IFRS 3. These proposals are, are about the information provided in the year of acquisition, which include requiring disclosures of expected synergies, defined pension liabilities and debt assumed, as well as some changes to the actual and pro forma information disclosed about the acquiry. So that covers what I was going to say on the ISB's preliminary views on disclosures. So I think I'll hand over to Rasmus now. Uh, thank you, Tim. So um, let's turn it to, to Rasmus for uh, the views, uh, preliminary views of, of AFRAG on, on that first part. Rasmus. Yeah, thank you. And as it appears from slide 12, AFRAG's preliminary view is that most, but not all, of the proposed disclosures in the ISB's discussion paper in principle would be useful. However, as it appears on the next slide, slide 13, EFRAG notes that the proposals are related to business combinations and as such do not solve the issues related to goodwill accounting. In its draft comment letter, EFRAG notes that it could have been beneficial if the information on the success of an acquisition in case that it would involve a substantial amount of goodwill, could also be used to assess the reported goodwill figures. If the objectives of an acquisition would not be met, this could indicate that the acquired goodwill would be impaired, but because of the shielding effect, an impairment loss might not be recognized. However, the approach suggested in the discussion paper will not be particularly useful for this purpose as information would only be provided to the extent that it is used to monitor the acquisition by the management. Nevertheless, a side effect of the proposal could be that the level at which an acquisition is monitored would be an indicator of the level at which goodwill should be tested for impairment. EFRAC disagrees with the proposals that the disclosures on the objective of an acquisition and whether these have been met should be based on what the chief operating decision maker monitors. EFRAC tentatively considers that the information should be based on what is monitored at a lower level. 
EFRA questions the reliability of the information related to the objectives of an acquisition and the synergies and acknowledges that some consider the information to be difficult to audit. EFRA accordingly questions whether the resulting benefits would outweigh the costs. EFRA has not yet formed a view and is consulting its constituents on whether it is practical and appropriate to disclose the proposed information in the financial statements instead of providing the information as part of the management commentary as the information is based on management expectations and refers to non-GAAP indicators. And then some specific comments. EFRAC's tentative view is that an entity would have to disclose if it stops monitoring an acquisition within three years instead of the two years proposed in the discussion paper. And EFRAC does not consider that the proposed requirement to also provide performer information on cash flows from operating activities would result in particularly useful information. So on slide 14, the next slide, you can see that EFRAC is concerned that the proposed disclosures might require entities to present commercial sensitive information. And EFRAC accordingly supports that the ISB is doing further activities to understand this issue. EFRAC is thus interested in learning whether preparers assess that the proposals would mean that they would have to disclose commercial sensitive information. As mentioned before, and uh, similarly at the ISB, EFRAC is also uncertain whether the disclosures would be better placed in the management commentary. Some users EFRAC has spoken with have been of the view that the information should be presented in the financial statements as they consider the information to be important. However, some other stakeholders have noted that the information is forward-looking and as such better placed in the management commentary. In addition to learning about operational uh, implications of the discussions papers proposals, its cost and the expected reliability of the information, IFRAC is also interested in learning about any constraints within jurisdictions that would conflict with the suggestions. In relation to the performer information, IFRAC notes that the manner in which business combinations are accounted for is disruptive for analysts trend analysis. For example, when inventory is remeasured at fair value following the purchase price allocation, profit margins after the acquisition will not anymore reflect an estimate of the entity's future profit margins. EFRAC observes that alternative performance measures are used to eliminate from operating profit the impact of the effects of the purchase price allocation. EFRAC has therefore considered whether it would be more useful to present further modified figures than operating profit before acquisition related transaction and integration costs. In addition to excluding acquisition related transaction and integration costs, such a figure could also exclude the effects of the revaluations to fair value. Although EFRAC considers such figures to be useful, it is unsure how costly they would be to prepare. Accordingly, EFRAC is consulting on this issue. Finally, EFRAC is interested in understanding how users would react to information that an entity is not monitoring a significant acquisition and an input on whether any of the current disclosure requirements in IFRS 3 could be removed without depriving investors of material information. And with that, I will hand back to you, Olivier. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Olivia, I think you're on mute. Thank you very much, Rasmus. Uh, so we're going to um, now seek views from our panelists. And I would like to start with uh, Javier, uh, if I may, um, with a first question as a user. Uh, what are you looking for? And are the proposals uh, meeting your expectations? Well, thank you, Olivier. Um, basically, as a user, and my, my experience as a user is that I want to hold management accountable. So, and to hold them accountable, I need to have some some measures, some goalposts. So, the proposal to to give this additional information regarding the strategic rationale and what the acquisition brings to the table, 
I think is is the right direction. Otherwise, uh, management might be too focused on empire building and on wasting uh, invest, uh, uh, shareholders' money on acquisitions that at the end of the day destroy value or even put the company at risk. So asking for more information is the, the right direction. Um, thank you, uh, Javier. Um, so now let's um, have the views from a preparer, Emanuele. Uh, what are the challenges that you can think of uh, when looking at those new requirements? Uh, and especially in thinking that uh, potential sensitivity uh, or uh, are the required information at the right place? Is it, uh, do they belong to the financial statements or should they, uh, should they go elsewhere? Emanuele. Good morning. Uh, I think that uh, when we enter in a business combination uh, is uh, always uh, an extraordinary deal for the company. And so we have uh, uh, to be very careful to manage uh, sensitive uh, information uh, such as uh, synergies, not only for the external uh, uh, commercial uh, issue, but uh, also uh, considering uh, that uh, uh, sometimes integration and synergies involve uh, the company and the part of the company as well. So uh, is uh, always uh, something uh, that uh, uh, we, we manage uh, carefully and uh, we avoid uh, to have a fully disclosure internally and uh, externally. For sure, uh, uh, increase the information and the level of information uh, is very useful, but uh, we have also to thinking and to avoid unnecessary cost uh, due to the fact that normally user looking for managerial accounts for sure, but uh, probably as, you may, uh, as we mentioned before, at uh, a higher level. So in terms of uh, segment and uh, not uh, looking for the single GGU. So this uh, should be a point because uh, if we fix uh, strictly uh, some information at uh, acquisition level, probably uh, we, we have to use uh, uh, internal uh, information uh, not so useful for, uh, uh, for user and uh, uh, not uh, uh, properly uh, managed internally, considering that sometimes most of it, mostly uh, the business is run at the segment level after the integration and not uh, for uh, the single acquisition, uh, the former acquisition. This is also a problem in terms of financial disclosure. For sure, uh, we, uh, to avoid any issue with auditors and supervisors, uh, it's better to, 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 to include it, uh, this kind of information in managerial uh, uh, information and not uh, at financial statement. That probably is uh, always uh, more concentrated on, uh, on, on uh, state uh, figures uh, and uh, not uh, on a projection and uh, what is going on uh, in, uh, in the future. And this is also a point uh, uh, concerning purchase price allocation, uh, considering that is uh, an exercise that uh, will run uh, the first year of the acquisition, but then uh, is, uh, is more difficult to follow straight in the next year. So if we increase uh, too much uh, the information that uh, we, 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 we must uh, give to the market, then uh, for us uh, it's the event uh, very costly to maintain uh, during the years. Thank you, Emanuele. Um, so uh, you can see on your screen that you have uh, two putting questions that have been um, that, that for which we would like your input. Um, uh, so if they do not appear full, fully, you have to scroll down to see uh, the second one. And then once you have responded, uh, right at the bottom, you have um, right at, at the bottom of the, the screen, you have a uh, submit button. Um, so the first question, do you think that it is possible to disclose information on the achievement of the targets initially defined at acquisition date and of expected synergies without triggering commercial sensitivity? 
Uh, and then the other question, uh, do you agree with the ISB's proposal to present the proposed information in the notes to the financial statements uh, rather than um, elsewhere? Uh, so um, you have a few seconds to, to respond. Um, and then uh, once you will have responded, I will turn it to uh, Leo uh, van der Tess as an uh, auditor and to understand what are uh, his views on uh, the challenges as auditor with respect to the proposed um, disclosures and especially in terms of auditability and, and whether uh, and the level at which uh, the information which are asked are uh, uh, reflecting the right level or on that. Uh, so, uh, but I'd like first to finalize uh, the polling question. So, I, uh, uh, Gloria, if you could uh, close the, the, the questions and that we can see uh, the responses, please. So again, you have to uh, press the submit button, which is at the bottom of your uh, of your screen. So let's see the results. Um, so we have the majority. So to the first question, whether it is possible to disclose without triggering commercial sensitivity. Um, the majority think that sometimes it would be possible, but sometimes it would not be possible. Uh, um, and uh, so it's the majority with 52%. Uh, um, and then to the other question, do you think it is? Uh, oh, yes, and then we have 36% that uh, believe that it is not possible to disclose such information without uh, impairing something, uh, without, a, uh, without triggering a commercial sensitivity. Um, so uh, to the next question, which is, do you agree with the ISB's proposal to present the proposed information in the notes uh, to the financial statements? Uh, so uh, well, actually, it's widely uh, spread because um, uh, it goes, it's, it's, it fluctuates from uh, 18 to 27 percent for each of the responses, except uh, response D, for which uh, there should be, uh, which is only at 8 percent, uh, there should be an option to either disclose in the notes or in the management report. But all the other ones are, are, are pretty uh, evenly spread. So um, thank you for those responses. So I now turn it to Leo on uh, the first reactions as auditor on uh, the disclosures. Thank you very much, uh, Olivier, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, great to be uh, in this webinar. Um, so, Olivier, I think that these results uh, already provide a good starting point for, for discussion. Uh, and I'll leave the first question for Emmanuel, but the second one on, uh, on disclosures and where to disclose these, that goes also to the heart of what, uh, uh, where the audit comes in. Um, so, if you look at those disclosures, um, part of it is factual, so not, not, not necessarily a problem to be put into the financial statements. Um, part of it is, yes, indeed, forward-looking. Now, forward-looking in itself may not necessarily be a problem. Uh, there's a lot of forward-looking information already in the financial statements. Um, however, what these particular disclosures also require is management's perception of those results and uh, management's expectations about a particular business combination. And that's where it, of course, uh, raises some issues around uh, whether uh, you can audit that and if so, how and, and what you measure it against. Um, so uh, rather than just making a binary management commentary or, or notes uh, decision, uh, maybe the idea, maybe the solution would be to um, think about what disclosures 
um, in terms of their nature better fit within the financial statements and what within their nature would better fit within the management commentary. Um, it's not just an audit issue, of course, because the practice statement on management commentary by the ISB is not a mandatory standard. So it's also around, uh, uh, the, the, let's say, the, the authority um, and, um, and the required level of disclosure that this has, has a bearing on. Um, what we believe is, is, is key here is to field test uh, the proposals to see how, how practical this all is, uh, to what extent you can actually, uh, so what the information is that is available, what is the best way, where is the best way to put it, so management commentary for financial statements, um, and, um, and then work, uh, work from there. And because in generally, I very much welcome the improved disclosures about business combinations, managements, monitoring of their success or not, uh, and the actual uh, comparison of expectations with reality. Um, th th that also brings me to the level at which uh, the information is monitored, uh, Olivier, and um, and also in the in the response from EFRAC. Um, Rasmus uh, explained that EFRAC is not necessarily um, convinced that you should look at the, the CODM level uh, alone, and I think that's a fair comment uh, because many of these business combinations are not, or sorry, the monitoring of the acquisition and their success is not is not necessarily done at the CODM level, but perhaps one level or sometimes even two levels below at the division or segment level and it would be it would be a shame if useful information would then not appear in the in the annual report uh, just because of the level at which it is monitored so um, perhaps a better way to look at this is more like taking a materiality view and say okay what are let's say the material acquisitions that i'd like to get more information on um, and then take the decision whether you limit that to information that's already uh, collected by the company uh, or where the ISB wants to go further and say you also need to collect this and this information in, in addition regardless of whether you, you uh, collect that already. Um, and maybe uh, to, uh, before I uh, go on too long, Olivier, one reminder of the pro forma information, uh, both Tim and, uh, and, and Rasmus talked about that already. Um, what we see currently in practice is that, uh, of course, pro forma information is already provided because IFRS 3 already requires you to do that. Um, but the the way in which that's done is quite different, uh, quite divergent uh, from one company to the next. Uh, so here is where uh, some further, so yes, very useful disclosures, uh, but we could uh, have more guidance on how you actually prepare that information uh, because that is quite divergent uh, at the moment. So stop here, Olivier, and happy to discuss further. Thank you, uh, Leo. Um, so before I uh, turn it back to uh, Robert, uh, we have two new polling questions. Um, so the first one uh, uh, regarding that relates to management stewardship. Do you think that the ISB's proposed disclosure uh, will allow to provide useful information to assess management stewardship. And uh, another question, uh, the ISB is proposes to, proposes to provide information, so strategic rationale, objectives of an acquisition and subsequent performance, based on the information the entity's chief operating decision maker uh, monitors. Do you think this is the right level? So please take uh, 30 seconds to uh, respond. Okay, um, as, um, may maybe we can leave it open for a few more seconds because uh, I think we, we would like, we would welcome 
more responses <laughs> um, to, to to have more feedback. So uh, we leave it uh, for a few few more seconds, but uh, I'm going to turn it now to Robert um, with a new question on uh, well, his view as uh, enforcer. Uh, what, what are your views, uh, Robert, on, on the proposed uh, disclosures? Good morning, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity to participate in this webinar. So I'm expressing my personal view, not necessarily the view of rep. So first of all, we are enforcers. We love the disclosures. So we think that proposed disclosure requirements would be useful to reach the overall aim of providing investors with better information about the subsequent performance of acquisitions. But as we've seen in the past, acquisitions are rarely monitored against initial objectives. So usually performance of business combinations monitored only against one year budget, even if in many cases monitoring also is not practical or the management can easily avoid documenting the performance of the acquisition since in most cases as we have experienced and discussed with companies, the acquired business will be integrated into the company organization, and so no more relevant figures are uh, possibly published. We are also concerned that linking the disclosure requirements only to the information that management decides to produce or not to produce can contradict the overall aim of the IRSB. So this is my point of view to the disclosure requirements. I give it to Olivier. Thank you, Robert. Um, so in the meantime, uh, while you were talking, we were finalizing uh, the responses to the last uh, two polling questions. And what you can see on your screen uh, to the first question, uh, whether the, the, the new disclosures would improve management stewardship, uh, there is a strong majority, so nearly 70%, that believes that in principle, yes, but due to completeness, reliability, the ability to provide the information in practice, the information in many cases will not be particularly useful. Um, and of course, I would welcome reactions from uh, the panelists on, on the responses that, uh, that, that we have. Uh, to, the, to the other question, um, so whether the, um, uh, the, the new information uh, uh, are presented at the right level. Um, and so we have a 46% uh, uh, that believes that no, the ISB should not introduce another threshold into IFRS. Companies should apply materiality judgment to determine what to disclose. And uh, another significant group of 34% that believes that, uh, well, actually, yes, uh, it is the right level. This is a pragmatic approach in balancing the benefits of the disclosure with the cost of providing the information. So um, are there any um, reactions from uh, the panelists? And while uh, panelists can react, of course, in the meantime, uh, I'm reminding to the participants that you can ask questions. Um, uh, so there, there, you might have encountered a technical problem with asking questions. If you have that problem, you can refresh your screen and you will ask the box with uh, ask a question that, that should appear. Um, at this stage, I don't see any uh, uh, actually, Tim would like to, to comment. So, uh, Tim. Thanks, Olivia. I just thought I'd comment on a, a few of the comments that the panelists uh, have made and, and also that Rasmus made as, as, as well, uh, just a, a couple of them, and also on the polling questions. I mean, in the polling question about the location of the information, whether it should be the financial statements, or the management commentary. I think the, the, the majority seem to suggest it should be in the management commentary. I think only 
27% or so were, were saying it should be in the financial statements. I, I guess, uh, going back to the point that I made at the start, that the issue here, I think, if, uh, and the board understands that some of this information might be the type of information that should be in the management commentary is, that you would typically find in the management commentary. But uh, the, 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 the issue, I guess, is, is whether companies would volunteer this information in their management commentary if the board didn't have it as a requirement in the financial statements uh, and whether it would be any different to the situation that we're in today where we're being told by investors that they're not getting sufficient information um, and so that was why the board went down that route uh, and so I think stakeholders who have the view that it should be in the management commentary I think what the board would like to hear from them is how do they think the board should encourage then companies to provide this information, given that, as Leo said, our guidance in this area is, is non-mandatory. Um, a couple of people did mention about field testing, and that would be a good idea, and the board is undertaking some field testing with some companies to, to help explore some of the issues with providing these, these disclosures. Um, on the, the polling question and the comments around the CODM level, the, so the chief operating decision maker, uh, and the board used that as a threshold, really, because it wanted to focus on the most important information about the most important um, business combinations. Uh, it seems that most that there's quite a few that stakeholders think uh, that's not the appropriate level. It should be a lower level, and investors won't be getting all the information that they need. I guess the the, the thing those stakeholders would need to then think about is. Uh, because this is what the board did hear from some stakeholders and has continued to hear from some stakeholders. If a normal materiality judgment was made on this and you, uh, and you were disclosing all of this information for all acquisitions, material acquisitions, um, how onerous a disclosure would that be? Because if you've got a company that's making two or three acquisitions a year and for each of those acquisitions there's three or four objectives um, and they're monitoring that then for two or three years, that disclosure soon builds up. So uh, that's that's just the question I would, would put to that, uh, to those stakeholders. And then finally on commercial sensitivity, that's obviously a, a, a key point. The polling question brought that out. Uh, Mr. Flamini brought that out as well. I, I guess um, the board would love to hear from stakeholders about commercial sensitivity and some sort of uh, examples of that and why, uh, and why stakeholders think the information could be commercially sensitive. The board has heard from investors. They say, well, actually, companies provide a lot of information when acquisitions happen in their press releases, in investor packs as part of uh, investor days on the acquisition, in analyst presentations. And there's a lot of information in there about strategic rationale, the objectives, the benefits of, of, of an acquisition. And, and all investors are looking for is follow up on that information. Uh, and to see how um, the acquisition has then subsequently performed. Uh, and if companies are prepared to provide that information at the start on acquisition day, how can it be commercially sensitive, is, is what investors say. And then I guess the, the, the final thing on commercial sensitivity is we've talked about the information could be commercially sensitive, but actually is commercial sensitivity a good enough reason for not providing the information because some investors would say isn't that just the price of being a listed company you've used my money you've used investors capital to make this acquisition and i need to hold you to account for these decisions and to assess the uh, uh, these decisions uh, and yeah if some of that information is commercially sensitive well that's isn't that just the price of being a listed company and using investors capital so that's it thanks olivia uh, thank you, Tim. Um, so there are um, quite uh, a few questions that have been asked by the participants. Um, some of them relate to the problem of auditability of the information. So uh, on that point, maybe I can turn it to uh, Leo as uh, auditor. Uh, what is his view on some of the, the things that, that would be required? especially estimates of synergies, for instance, which is one of the examples which are, which is uh, given by um, uh, uh, the participants and many other metrics uh, that will especially be non-financial, like achieved market share in a specific market, or non-IFRS figures, numbers defined solely by the company. Uh, so in terms of uh, reliability, 
uh, what is uh, the, the perspective of, of the, uh, the auditors in that respect. Thanks, Olivier. And indeed, <clears throat> one of the questions asked by, by the by the participants in the web webinar is uh, is what is, what if this information not just non financial, uh, but but even if it is financial, but it is non IFRS, uh, what do you do? Um, and and indeed, this uh, poses issues around verifiability, uh, but also it uh, links it to the current project of the uh, of the ISB on uh, on uh, presentation and disclosure uh, and particularly the use of uh, measurement uh, management performance measures um, so um, if for example the success or not of a business acquisition is measured uh, on the basis of non IFRS financial data uh, what does this mean if you put in the financial statements because that would automatically bring in uh, MPMs potentially in, uh, in in those financial statements uh, with all the related disclosures um, and um, at least links it to the disclosure requirements in the general in the in the presentation and disclosure uh, project. Um, uh, another uh, thing is is um, is uh, so and this also means that in terms of where you put the information is is is, is going to be key. Uh, whether you put it in the financial statements or whether you put it in the uh, management commentary, uh, both from an author's perspective as well as from a regulated perspective, because the uh, alternative performance measure guidance uh, of regulators applies to, uh, at least f for now, um, uh, or to what is in the management commentary. Um, and uh, the ISB's guidance is going to be focused on the financial statements. So. Um, Verifiability is a real issue uh, here. Uh, not so. So some of those uh, financial numbers can e can can be uh, can be audited, um, but for example, when it comes to management analysis of that or or the perception of that, that of course is something that lends itself much more for being uh, a discussion in the uh, in the management commentary. Thank you, Leo. Um... Uh, hi. So there are a few other questions, um, and, and many relate to the sensitivity of, of the information. Uh, some of them are also linked to, uh, and I don't know whether Robert would I would have a view, but um, with respect to to the value of the synergies. So disclosure of the expected synergies may trigger legal questions as it effectively discloses the price range that the acquirer is looking at. So in this regard, the transaction price might be challenged by regulators and tax authorities. Further, it may deteriorate the negotiation position of the acquirer for future acquisitions. Um, uh, so, as the, the questions seem to be directed to uh, regulators, would uh, Robert, would you have uh, a view on that? Uh, yes, uh, we would appreciate this disclosure as as we have some more information about the acquisition. But we can also see this uh, uh, challenging environment if this information is disclosed. So I, I expect it uh, to be not disclosed, but as a regulator, I would prefer it. Yeah. Okay, uh, so despite the, the risk of, but do you, do you perceive, Robert, there, there would be a, uh, a risk of, well, legal risk associated with that disclosure? It could be. I'm. I'm not a lawyer, unfortunately, yeah. but it could be. I. I can imagine that. Okay. Um, uh, Emanuele, uh, would you like to react? No, I think that uh, the point of synergies uh, is uh, quite important because uh, usually when you enter in acquisition uh, is uh, also a bargain uh, and so a discussion between the two counterparties. And uh, normally, the acquirer have uh, uh, remain uh, some synergies in the pocket uh, just to use uh, e e forward looking. So uh, it's difficult to fix exactly the synergies that we bring uh, to the price because uh, the fair value is, uh, is, uh, is a pure negotiation between the counterparties. Uh, and uh, usually, you don't show 
exactly uh, how far uh, you, 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 you can arrive. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, something uh, very careful uh, to use, considering that, uh, I mean, uh, any acquisition or, or any business uh, is uh, very complex uh, and uh, couldn't be uh, set up uh, in a mechanic view. So my, my concern is always uh, not to, 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 to bring uh, the accounting principle to a mechanic and arithmetical uh, view. Uh, because uh, it's uh, too simplistic and then uh, it's, very, it's very difficult uh, to avoid impairment uh, if you reduce uh, the gap and the range. Probably today is too much, but uh, we, 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 we also to consider the complexity of uh, a business combination and uh, acquisition inside uh, the, the single company. Thank you, thank you, Emanuele. Um, uh, another question that maybe can be directed to both uh, Tim and Javier, um, uh, relating to uh, circumstances where there are multiple acquiring businesses which are integrated into a combined business. Would the information based on the combined entities still be of value to investors? Uh, there is a potential that the aggregated information will not have any benefit towards the assessment of the performance of a single acquisition. Um, so, Tim, Ravier, would you have uh, a, a view on, on that question? Um, maybe I'll go first, it's Tim here. Uh, so, so um, I mean, in a way, it... It depends. It depends a little bit on how management are actually monitoring the success of their business combinations, uh, and, and so if if there were several acquired businesses, um, e, uh, uh, acquired together, I guess this must mean, uh, and and combined with uh, the the existing business, if management are monitoring that on a on a combined basis. Um, then, then I guess the disclosures are looking. Uh, it is a management approach, and the disclosures are looking for the information that management are using to monitor their, their business combinations. It has to be said, um, we haven't specifically considered uh, this this particular issue. Um, but if if these are just a series of acquired businesses uh, over time, um, you know, one would imagine management would be uh, monitoring. Uh, the, the the acquisitions individually in some manner as well, but it it all depends on how management believe themselves is the best way to monitor whether a business combination is a success or not and is achieving those objectives. The board is then looking for that information to be disclosed because in in the board's view that information would then be useful for users to make their own assessments of whether um, those business combinations have been a success or not. But on this specific issue of combining lots of acquired businesses together with an existing business and, and then looking at that overall piece, the board hasn't necessarily thought about that particular issue. It's an interesting point. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Um, Javier, as a user? Uh, yeah. As a user, if I find a company that is uh, building up a new division or a new business initiative, and to uh, achieve that, is becoming, understand my words, a serial acquirer, then uh, my instinct is to ask for even more information. Because if there are a lot of uh, acquisitions to build up something almost from scratch, then I need, at least at the board level, the same info, or at least, of course, uh, providing I'm not giving uh, sensitive uh, proprietary information, but I need the same information that the board is using to monitor if they're, if they're throwing good money after good money, if they're not wasting resources. So yes, I mean, in that, in that situation, even more, at least as a user, as a financial, uh, as a financial analyst, I'll be uh, researching and monitoring that situation because more and more uh, capital is being plowed into that strategy. Thank you, Javier. Uh, so maybe, Javier, uh, another question for you uh, that we have received from a um, 
uh, participant. The, the, um, e even though, actually, it's both to you, Tim, and, and Javier. <laughs> Does the ISB think that the investors will reward companies for disclosing information which could make the intended strategy impossible to implement? Um, what do you mean impossible to implement? I don't un understand the, 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 the question in that sense, that impossible to implement the strategic rationale. Do you think, Olivier, could you clarify that? Uh, I'm not sure I can clarify. This is the oh. way the question has been worded <laughs> by, by, by the participants. Um, I'm taking that as, uh, I don't know, maybe a, a challenge in uh, uh, a challenge in implementing the, the, the strategy, but which is the, the plan, but which appears to be difficult to implement. And um... I, I, my interpretation of the question uh, is that if something, if things go wrong, right, you know, that and management cannot achieve what they or can, they cannot fulfill what they previously promised. Uh, welcome to the real world. I mean, but I think uh, investors will. Always, at least, of course, in the in the in the medium to long term, they will always reward management that provide transparency in a consistent way. And also, when you do an acquisition, uh, and you do an acquisition well, and after two or three years, that acquisition is doing better than expected, uh, then your company is going to be valued more than its comparables. So I think that. Being transparent and consistent with the information that you provide to your own shareholders, it's always worth it. Um, uh, another question that, that has been asked, and, and then we, I think we'll have to move on to our next topic in the interest of time, but um, I, there was a question relating to uh, uh, how widespread the views from investors might be with respect to uh, the new disclosures which are uh, asked. And uh, Rasmus or Catherine, maybe you have uh, some more information on that? I can, I can, I can uh, perhaps answer. Well, we, we do not have uh, the frequency, but often when we present uh, these new disclosures are here for, for, for investors and, and users, they say, yes, it is that we, what we want disclosures on is, in fact, how successful a business combination has been instead of disclosures about goodwill. The goodwill figure is not so interesting for us, but what is interesting in, is to see whether a business combination has been a success. Okay, thank you, Rasmus. Um, and maybe one last, both a comment and a question to uh, to Tim. Um, in IS 37, uh, it is possible when <clears throat> there are some litigations that, uh, if disclosed, <clears throat> would put the entity at a risk of disclosing too sensitive information. Then, in that case, uh, there could be arguments to not to disclose such information. Um, uh, well, except that IS-37 is also asking to explain why such information is sensitive. So it, it is a bit circular. But is it something that um, uh, you could consider in terms of um, requiring disclosures uh, by uh, allowing entities that believe that uh, such uh, uh, if an information is too, some, too commercially sensitive, that it could be waived from disclosing such information? I mean, that, that's, quite, that, that's uh, a very specific um, exemption that's been provided in, in, in IS-37. Um, I mean, uh, this goes back, and I think that the previous question was about um, could, could commercially, providing commercially sensitive information actually um, um, impede the company from uh, achieving its its objectives, and I think I, what I would go back to, to is is saying I think this is what the stakeholder wants to explore. Uh, sorry, what the board wants to explore with stakeholders is um, the nature of this information. Why is it commercially sensitive? Is it really commercially sensitive? How is it commercially sensitive in terms of 
uh, some, some more specific examples because investors also say, I think, that actually your competitors know quite a lot about you. Uh, and when you're doing an acquisition, you know, the, 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 the marketplace is already sort of making some assumptions ar around what, what might well be being done. And so I, I think um, the board would want to, to, to hear some more sort of detailed feedback on the nature of this information and why it is particularly commercially sensitive. I mean, if there was an exception that was provided to it, then the danger there is that uh, all companies then just say this information is all, all commercially sensitive. And the question really is, is this information really all commercially sensitive? Um, so it's, it's something the board wants to obviously uh, explore further. Thank you, Tim. Well, uh, so in the interest of time, I suggest we move on to the second topic on whether we can improve the effectiveness of the impairment test. And so, Tim, I suggest that you carry on. Yeah. Uh, can we have the slides back, please? I think I want, uh, I think it's slide 16, if we can start at that. Let's see that. Uh, brilliant. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so, we'll now discuss the other main topic in the discussion paper, the subsequent accounting for goodwill. Two key pieces of feedback were that stakeholders said that impairment losses were recognised too late. Investors have often reflected reductions in their valuations long before impairment losses are recognised by companies. And secondly, stakeholders said that the impairment test is costly and complex. In response to this feedback, the ISP explored whether it could make the impairment test more effective at recognising impairment losses on acquired goodwill on a more timely basis. And we'll take a look at the ISP's work in that area first, and then we'll look at the ISP's preliminary views on its efforts to reduce the cost and complexity of the test and whether to reintroduce amortisation. So the ISP identified two possible reasons for the too late issue. Cash flow forecasts that are too optimistic and shielding. On the first issue, IS 36 requires management to use forecasts that are reasonable and supportable to assess the reasonableness of assumptions by examining causes of differences between past forecasts and actual cash flows and to assess the reasonableness of those past forecasts. In addition, companies are required to disclose information about the assumptions used to provide users of financial statements with information to assess the reliability of impairment tests. The ISP's preliminary view is that if forecasts are too optimistic, this is more of an implementation issue that's better dealt with by auditors and regulators than by standard setting. So if we can turn to the next slide, please. So this slide uh, explains the second issue, which can lead to impairment losses on goodwill not being recognised when stakeholders might think they should be, which is shielding. Before we start, an important point to mention here is that the impairment test is not a direct test of goodwill. Goodwill does not generate cash flows on its own. It can only generate cash flows in combination with other assets or groups of other assets. And so it can be tested for impairment only with those other assets. Goodwill is therefore tested for impairment in a cash generating unit or group, a group of cash generating units. Hence, the test is an indirect test uh, since goodwill cannot be measured directly. The unit of account for the test is the cash generating unit. So this slide provides a simple example illustration of the shielding issue. So on the left hand side of the slide is the acquired business and something's not turned out as expected and an impairment loss would be recognised if the acquired business was tested in isolation. However, in most cases, the acquired business is integrated with some other part of the acquirer's business, often to achieve synergies management expected from the business combination. And in this example, the acquired business is integrated into one of the acquirer's existing businesses and there is significant headroom in that existing business. Its recoverable amount exceeds the carrying amount of its recognised assets. Maybe that's from internally generated goodwill that's not been recognised or unrecognised intangibles or simply because the fair values of the recognised assets are higher than their carrying amounts. Because in this example the combined business is tested for impairment as a cash generating unit, no impairment loss is recognised since as shown by the right hand side of the slide, the combined recoverable amount exceeds the combined carrying amount of the assets of the combined business. The headroom of the existing business is shielding the acquired goodwill from impairment. Hence, this simple example illustrates a too late issue. Shielding occurs in the current impairment test 
because the reduction in value is first absorbed by the unrecognised headroom. An impairment loss is recognised on the acquired goodwill only if all of that headroom has been uh, used up. So moving on to slide 18, please. Uh, the ISB looked at an approach to reduce the shielding effect, incorporating the headroom into the impairment test. This approach compares the recoverable amount to the carrying amount of the recognised assets plus the headroom from the previous impairment test. And this prevents the prior period headroom automatically absorbing any reduction in the value of the combined business. Any impairment that results, basically any re reduction in the headroom since the previous test, still needs to be allocated between the acquired goodwill and the unrecognised headroom. However, the approach attempted to allocate at least some of the reduction to the acquired goodwill, whereas in the current test it's first allocated to the unrecognised headroom. However, any allocation would still be imperfect because it's not possible to tell how much the reduction relates to the acquired goodwill and how much the reduction relates to the unrecognised headroom, since goodwill is not directly measurable. In addition, the approach would have been costly. So the ISB's preliminary view is that it's not feasible to design a different impairment test that's significantly more effective than the current impairment test in IS 36 at a reasonable cost. The ISB accepts the test is not perfect because goodwill has to be tested with other assets. Some degree of shielding will likely always occur. The test will not always provide a signal of how well the business combination is performing. But this does not mean the test has failed, as some people say. And although cash flow forecasts will always be judgmental, applied well, the test should meet its objective of ensuring that the carrying amount of the cash generating unit as a whole is recoverable. And the disclosures proposed on subsequent performance, which we've, we've just been through, should provide better information about the performance of a business combination than the impairment test can. In fact, providing such information is not the purpose of the impairment test. So that covers the first topic in this particular session. So I'll hand back to Olivia. Thank you, Tim. Um, so now let's uh, have the views from Efrag um, on that topic, and I turn it back to Catherine. Yes, um, thank you. Um, in its draft comment letter, Efrag states that it shares the ISB reservations on the possibility to develop a different and more effective impairment approach. However, Efrag believes that there are collateral areas of possible improvements. In particular, effects are just to address shielding that um, in due to uh, develop a more effective guidance on allocation of goodwill to the CGUs. So this could be enhanced to improve how the test is applied in practice. EFRA considered that the guidance could be clarified to help allocate goodwill to the lowest level possible that outweighs cost of impairment testing and information needs based on value relevance. There could be a rebuttable presumption uh, that uh, goodwill is allocated one level below segment. Um, this does not mean it has to be always one level below segment. A rebuttable presumption means it should be explained if it is on the segment level. And there would be such um, the, the, the um, users would receive a reason why it is uh, tested on the segment level. EFRAC also suggests that the ISB could consider enhancing the guidance for reallocation of goodwill. It is currently driven by changes in the reporting structure, whilst changes in the cash generation uh, should be considered as the basis for the reallocation. Um, Making the uh, strategic rationale of an acquisition more transparent and monitoring the success of an acquisition could help to better identify triggering events for goodwill impairment testing and define the structure of such tests. Um, the other um, issue that was um, identified for the too little too late um, issue is management over optimism. Uh, in addition, the, the um, draft comment letter um, includes, therefore, suggestions to address management over-optimism. 
There are proposed possible disclosure solutions for better transparency of estimations made by uh, management um, that EFRAC discussed. Um, and there were three different approaches discussed by EFRAC, which was a kind of backtesting. So the achievement of previous estimation could make over-optimism transparent. Um, there could be better information about the inform uh, assumptions taken related to the period before you go into the terminal value. So um, it could be more transparent whether you have a, a clear increase in the level of earnings and cash flows with which you go into the terminal value. And a third approach would be that you simply disclose uh, the level of uh, cash flows or earnings that are currently um, exist, that the uh, users of the financial statements would be able to make their own assumptions. The, um, so we are now on, on the slide 20. Um, so therefore, for these reasons, um, EFRAC asked uh, questions to constituents. So, um, and these relate to the topic that I was explaining before. So um, these uh, questions to constituents uh, are related to the allocation and reallocation of CGUs. Should the ISD consider to, to improve the guidance on these? whether management over-optimism is best addressed um, by auditors and regulators um, or by changing IFRS standards. That is one of the questions. Then the usefulness and practicability of the EFRA suggestions. So we would really like to understand if such approach, especially for management, to address the management over-optimism, as we are having it in the comment letter, would be practic, would be doable. Then uh, we um, are requesting, in addition, um, should the ISB consider to uh, reintroduce reversal uh, or introduce a reversal of impairment. Um, so such reversal of impairment uh, could take some pressure from the impairment testing. So for example, uh, there could be a one-year window to allow re reversal of impairment. That is another topic that we would like to address in our comment letter. So with this, um, I would like to give back to you, Olivier. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so we understand uh, the ADISB's proposal and uh, EFRAC's preliminary views. So let's uh, seek views from our panelists with Diana. Uh, um, uh, Diana, as I said earlier, is a member of the board of the IVSC. So uh, what would be uh, your views as to what the potential solutions could be for improving the effectiveness of the impairment test, Diana. Thank you, Olivia. So uh, IVSC uh, decided to be aiding the discussion about uh, acquisition accounting by publishing a series of articles where we would express the valuers' view on what, because as much as valuers are involved in both fair value accounting and in impairment testing, uh, and with regards to impairment testing, I think that uh, the, the, the panelists have already mentioned that the biggest issues identified relate to the uh, impairment shielding by the internally generated headroom and the artificial headroom created by the amortization of acquired intangible assets. Uh, we have also discussed uh, the uh, impairment triggers, uh, whether they are too overly broad and outward looking and what could be um, improve there. And we also discuss certain behavioral consideration of management and the reluctance to, to take uh, impairment. Uh, so, uh, of course, probably a rather um, uh, revolutionary uh, uh, 
solution to all these uh, uh, questions, to all these uh, issues, would be um, to the recognition of internally developed uh, intangible assets and good goodwill, which the current accounting standards do not account for. But this is beyond the current uh, discussion, and I know that there is a special project going on within uh, both uh, EFRAC on intangible assets. Uh, well, another option to mitigate or to eliminate the impact of internally generated headroom is to test at a lower level. And I've heard that during the first discussion, there have been quite a lot of valid points raised whether uh, what should be the level of monitoring. Um, and um, it, it, currently, IS-36 defines uh, the CGU as the smallest ident identifiable group of assets that generate independence cash inflows. Well, what we uh, see very often is that uh, the segment reporting uh, cap, uh, which the standard allows, was uh, actually used uh, by companies to monitor um, the CGU performance at a much higher level. So, uh, again, um, we, we understand the complexities and we hear all the, the views of both users. So, on this point, probably uh, the users' uh, view would, uh, would be most, most important to consider. Um, so, um, within the current, um, within the current impairment model, uh, what the boards considered uh, and discussed in these articles. Um, we don't have time to go into the technicalities of all these approaches, but uh, as a matter of principle, these are uh, we have considered the step-up approach, which would calculate the internally generated headroom at the time of acquisition and would include it in the carrying amount of the CGUs in subsequent testing period. Uh, we recognize that why while this would account for the internally generated intangibles and uh, goodwill, uh, this, however, might add complexity to the test, um, and it might not account for the intangibles created after the acquisition date. So, are uh, similar to the step-up approach is uh, potentially alternative approach uh, is to include an adjustment to the carrying amount of the CGUs by the, by the cumulative uh, amortization of the acquired assets uh, subsequent uh, to the acquisition. Um, as I said, uh, uh, the board was discussing also, was, uh, was taken quite seriously also the issue of the um, raised by constituents that the current impairment test is rather costly. So we, we thought uh, of um, alternative approaches that would not increase the cost and complexity. And the direct comparison um, of the recoverable amount of CGUs at acquisition to its recoverable amount as of a subsequent test date might provide a direct uh, test of the value creation ability of a business. So uh, this approach would also provide an opportunity to, to reduce the overall cost and complexities. Um, it would eliminate the need to derive carrying amounts for the CGU at each testing date. And uh, depending on the company's complexity, uh, and procedures and procedures. Uh, the derivation of the carrying amounts typically require significant internal company effort as well as a lot of judgment. So uh, while this uh, uh, approach uh, might be uh, a more straightforward exercise to compare the value of the CGUs at uh, acquisition and at a subsequent testing date, it might not be an indicative of the drivers behind the value creation or the value loss, uh, because uh, uh, it would not indicate whether the potential value creation or value loss would have been uh, driven by the legacy business or by the newly created business. So, uh, as you see, there is no universal one-fits-all method of improving 
morning. Uh, so there's been a lot of discussions already about uh, the triggers uh, for the impairment tests. And in the articles, IVSC has um, indicated some um, measures and some ways of measuring uh, performance, acquisition performance in the respective uh, disclosures which might not be considered that sensitive. Uh, we all recognize the sensitivity of disclosing information um, uh, at a much more granular level, but this would, uh, uh, we, we do share some ideas about uh, indicators, uh, both uh, related to the uh, forecast information and to the KPIs that the business monitors, that might be useful for disclosures. Okay. So I would pass over to the other panelists at this stage. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Diana. Uh, so I see that the IVSC has um, many proposals. Um, so you have um, now on your screen a, another uh, question to, uh, to the participants. Uh, uh, linking that to the ISB's Promise that uh, there is uh, not a, sig uh, a significant way of improving the effectiveness of the impairment test. So, do you agree with that uh, preliminary view? So, yeah, uh, answer A: uh, some improvements would um, be needed and could improve the test. B, uh, you think that uh, no, the, the way it is currently designed is fine and doesn't need such improvement. And C, uh, you believe that it is not possible to enhance the test. Uh, so uh, aligning your uh, C's is aligned with the ISB's preliminary review. Uh, so take uh, 30 seconds to, to, to respond. In the interest of time, uh, we can move on to um, Emanuele. Um, uh, it has been raised by EFRAG as a possible uh, way to, to improve the effectiveness of the impairment test uh, to, to back test, uh, uh, the, to do a back testing. Um, what, what is your view on that, uh, on that approach as, as a preparer? Yes, Olivier. Uh, I believe backtesting is is a proper solution. Uh, I see uh, uh, in the market uh, too much optimistic and not projection align, aligned of what uh, the, the real potential of of the company express in, in the coming quarters. Uh, and so, uh, so this is uh, uh, this uh, should be a problem because uh, you always uh, posticipate uh, any uh, any impairment, uh, and uh, and so uh, linking uh, the projection and above all the external uh, explicit projection to the to to fix a terminal value uh, to uh, the, the the past performance uh, and the recent performance of the company in the CCU. Uh, it should be something uh, very useful uh, and uh, probably that limit uh, the possibility to, 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 to skip uh, uh, impairment test. And uh, uh, I saw in the past uh, some situation uh, that uh, where uh, back testing uh, uh, ran uh, very well. And uh, we have an example that uh, in a company after uh, two or three years uh, that the budget was completely missed, that uh, they, we impose uh, to use uh, not a projection to five, uh, to three to five years, but uh, just only one year. And so calculated the terminal value only on one year projection uh, is very, very careful. Uh, and so is uh, quite, uh, is more uh, relevant in terms of impact. Concerning uh, uh, the other topics uh, uh, expressed by YASB, I'm a little concerned on Edrum, uh, because Edrum is uh, something uh, useful in the past uh, to uh, address and uh, to, to, to speed up M&A process. 
Uh, we mentioned also before that uh, synergies is not only strictly linked uh, by, uh, to the, the acquired business, uh, but uh, also to uh, the acquirer. And then we have also to consider that uh, actually uh, purchase price allocation permits uh, company to split the goodwill in different uh, GGU and uh, not properly which uh, existing uh, or uh, which acquire because normally we, we are going to buy uh, companies uh, or uh, probably smaller than the existing, but with different business inside. And so it's difficult to follow strictly the acquired uh, if we have different uh, unit or, or a division that you, you put uh, inside your organization. So we have to take care that uh, linking too much uh, the impairment test to the acquired business uh, it should be a limit both for the consolidation of the system. You know, I, I'm from the banking activity and we, we have pressure by regulators to, to improve M&A and the dimension at the single institution in the single country, but both for the good exercise of the permit test that it shouldn't be follow what you acquire, but also considering the cash generating unit of, of the company forward looking. Thank you, Emanuele. So we heard you, but we didn't see you, unfortunately. Um, so um, uh, you still have the polling questions from uh, uh, on uh, on on whether we can improve on that or whether it shouldn't be improved. Um, uh, if you could please respond, we have we already have quite a few responses, but I uh, leave it, uh, leave it more, more, 15 more seconds for you to respond, uh, so that we can increase the, the size of, of the sample. Um, I now would like to turn it to Javier. Um, uh, as as a user, are you are you confident? that there can be ways to, to improve the, the effectiveness? No, I think it's a hopeless situation. And it doesn't have to do so much with the process per se, but it has to do, and again, and whenever they, whenever they talk, I talk from experience. I think it has to do with how risk within the, the corporation, within the company. And all my concerns regarding business combinations, goodwill and so forth, is because of the outliers. When the acquisitions go horribly wrong and they take down the, the company with them, resulting massive layoffs and of shareholders losing their investments. So of all the experiences I had with regarding those outliers, the situation was that within the organization was box populi that the acquisition was going horribly wrong. But the CEO or the CFO, the, the, the main champions of that acquisition that, that just a few years before had presented that acquisition to the markets, to investors, um, bragging and, and, and huffing and puffing, so to speak, did not want to see reality. And, and people were extremely afraid of losing their jobs by saying the emperor has no clothes. So my point is then you should give just a few KPIs, what we were discussing in the previous panel, and I think we'll be discussing in, in, the, in the, the next one. You should give a few KPIs so shareholders and investors will hold the company and management accountable. Because if we are waiting for employees to hold their bosses accountable, uh, I think we'll be waiting a long time. Thank you, Javier. Um, so I think your 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 view is is clear. Uh, so now let's let's look at what the participants think in terms of uh, whether it can or should be improved. Um, you can see the results on on your screen. Um, I think there is one. Uh, there, there seems to be some form of consensus that the model is not uh, fully effective. Um, but uh, then views are split as to whether it should it, it should give rise to some form of amendments uh, to be imposed or or no it shouldn't. 
uh, because now would be a belief, same as what the ISB is thinking, that uh, it cannot be improved at a reasonable cost. Um, so, of course, I will be happy to have reactions to, to that. Uh, but I'd like to, to show the next, um, well, I'd like to move, to move on to now, uh, Anne, um, uh, with, uh, a question, Anne, uh, on what is, what would be your view on, on, uh, as an academic, on what, uh, what, on whether, uh, uh, it can be improved. Okay. Thank you, Olivier. Uh, so thanks for, for the opportunity to, to participate to, to this webinar on a very interesting topic and, and, and hot topic, uh, goodwill impairment. Um, so in terms of academics, I think that um, empirical studies on, on managerial discretion and what we call timeliness of goodwill impairment could perhaps shed some lights on the too little, too late statements that you have um, referred to. So first, what, what do we know from research? We, first, we know that, that goodwill impairment <coughs> is really referred uh, to as one of the most complex accounting estimates that is subject to significant managerial discretion. So this is something that we know. Uh, since uh, the introduction of, um, of goodwill impairment. But uh, we also know uh, from, from research, and there is a growing body of evidence that is suggesting that firms do not always book economic impairments in a timely manner, and they tend to manipulate impairment tests. So we have some, some evidence of uh, the opportunistic use of managerial discretion around goodwill impairment in terms of amount and timeliness. And we also document some, some consequences of, um, of this managerial discretion. And one of the first consequences is um, that it could be associated with a decrease in the degree of conservatism of financial reporting. Uh, second, if managers opportunistically use their discretion regarding to the timing or the amount of reported goodwill impairment, of course, the resulting disclosure is unlikely to be informative because they rely on inappropriate impairment inputs. And the, the, the third consequence is that information that is communicated through disclosure would be noisier and investors may disregard the information provided by firms that manipulate impairment tests, as well as financial analysts, as um, Javier explained to us. Um, so knowing that and having this, um, this uh, evidence from, from, from empirical research, I think, and I'm not the only one to think that, that it is more an application issue than a, a standard per se issue because research also underlines that goodwill impairment decisions and the quality of disclosure are related to the intensity of monitoring, the intensity of oversight, and the enforcement. So apparently problems in current goodwill accounting may at least partly be an application issue that would be best addressed by other means rather than by changing the standard. So it seems that it's likely a question of application. And in relation to this question, um, it appears that I have conducted a study on the impact of key audit matters that flag goodwill impairment as an audit risk and their impact on management disclosure. And, and what we show with our research is that auditors could really play a monitoring role um, with a goodwill impairment issue, because when they flag goodwill impairment as a key audit matter in their expanded audit report, it really improves the quality and the quantity of information disclosed in the notes by the manager. So it is then, I think, interesting to see and to note that auditors could have a positive impact on the implementation of this standard and improve the quality of the standard per, per se. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Anne. Um, so we have another uh, polling question. 
um, which is seeking your view as to whether uh, uh, there would be uh, possibility to to have more discipline in relation to being over optimistic by management, while being feasible and practical for preparers. Um, so, uh, a disclose how actual cash flows differ from management's previous cash flow predictions. So, back testing. Uh, so, this is the comments and the reactions from uh, Emanuele that you heard. Uh, improve inf information on assumptions related to the period for which management has projected cash flows and specifically about terminal value projections. C, disclose the current level of cash flows to allow users to model themselves. D, all of the above would provide more discipline while being feasible and practical. And E, none of the above are feasible and practical for preparers of financial statements. So take a few seconds. Um, while you are responding, I'm going to turn it now to Leo. Uh, Leo, what would be your, your perspective on, on that topic and whether you, you have a view as well on, on Anne's proposal on, uh, regarding uh, the role of, of the auditors? with respect to um, impairment test and its efficiency. Thank you very much, uh, Olivier. And uh, yes, a, a couple of comments uh, from, from my side. So first of all, I think this is really the key question in, in, the, in the whole discussion paper, because this forces people to um, understand and, and take a view on what the Google impairment test is trying to achieve uh, in the first place. Um, so it is presented as part of the business combination disclosures. Uh, so it suggests that um, it is there to assess the success or not of an individual business combination. But as Tim already laid out, and, and also the IVSC has explained, there's a lot of noise in that method. So it was probably never really designed to do exactly that, uh, but was more to to make sure that the, that the value of the CGU tested uh, is not lower than its carrying amount. So um, if the board proceeds as, as currently um, envisaged uh, to not make changes because, because you can't get to that other alternative, to that pure test of uh, whether business combination was successful or not, then it's probably good to um, manage expectations on that and, and avoid people having the impression that, uh, that it is trying to do that. Um, because that triggers people's uh, mi uh, mindset of a too little, a too late uh, 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 issue, in which there may not be if you take away the headroom. So if you if you uh, uh, if you present the test as a, a test to see whether the CGU is still worth its value, then uh, that probably puts people in a different mindset. Um, the, the the second uh, point was was over optimism uh, by by management and. Um, um, so to, to that, maybe two comments. Uh, so for, first of all, um, um, yes, you can argue that's not a problem with the standard. It's more a problem of application, uh, audit, uh, and enforcement. But um, I think the standard set can help here by, uh, by for example, improving disclosure, as, 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 as the board already has in mind, but also to think about the level at which uh, level of aggregation uh, of, of CGUs and pr providing more guidance on, on that. Um, uh, for example, the way the US did that, um, or by just having a, um, as, as suggested by EFRAC, um, a, a, a default of one level below a reporting segment. Um, but also it's good to bear in mind that um, it's, it's easy to say, okay, why do you do the, this, this huge impairment this quarter? Why not previous quarter or previous year? And, um, and and that uh, I think is also good to remind that um, the risk of impairment is not a linear risk. It's not like it sort of grow, goes into a certain uh, bad direction. Um, normally, it all goes well until it doesn't, and if it doesn't go well anymore, it quickly um, falls off the cliff. Uh, and that's what what is driving impairment losses, particularly the large ones. Um, it, Management realizes that uh, it's just not sustainable, and then they lose uh, the uh, the support. Uh, they, they take away the support of that business, and uh, you then suffer a huge impairment loss. 
So also there, it's, it's managing expectations about what investors can read from into the Google impairment test. Uh, and then maybe uh, finally, Olivier, uh, to respond to, to Anne's um, uh, uh, comments about the camps, the, the key audit matters. Um, I, I, I fully agree with, with and, and fully um, understand the results because we've not seen this just for the Google impairment test. Uh, as soon as the auditor uh, puts more more of the, sh the, the lights on, on particular judgments, uh, it's, it forces management to, to reconsider whether they have been open enough on, on those judgments and, uh, and, uh, and estimates. Um, and um, Maybe also one uh, one thing, uh, Tim, to bear in mind: um, um, over optimism, uh, uh, as Xavier already said, is something around why is management much more optimistic than markets. Uh, so, and, and um, so, one of the things you could consider is uh, we currently have a uh, an indicator in IS36 that says if the market cap is below uh, ac book equity, uh, that is a reason to. Um, uh, to, to reconsider uh, the, um, the assumptions made. One of the things you could, uh, could uh, look at is um, if management's assessment of the value of the CTUs is, uh, in, in total is, is larger than the, than the market cap, that management is forced to explain how they get to those numbers and, and explain why they think they have a better perspective than the market on uh, on these. So just a, f just a few f ideas to, to throw out here and um, um, back to you, Olivier. Olivier, you are on mute. Could you please? Yes, uh... thank you very much, Leo. Uh, so now to, uh, as, as a last uh, speaker to on, on that session, I'd like to turn it to Robert uh, as a regulator. And Robert, what is your uh, your experience with respect to the enforcement of AS36 uh, and the challenges and, and your recommendations? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, as we were already mentioned at the discussion paper of the IRSB for regulators to to fight against uh, over-optimism in the impairment test. So it should be mentioned that goodwill impairment test is also the first place in our error hit list. So enforcement of goodwill is difficult due to management judgment and estimates. IRS 36 requires reasonable and supportable assumption. But there is not a, a definition what this means. For example, we have many companies that forecast increasing cash flows over the detailed planning period. If this medium term goals are not achieved, they have always concrete reasons like Corona or US dollar or something like that. So, and after that, they have uh, once more a quite optimistic view perhaps. And so, we we couldn't challenge this estimate because does this really mean that the subsequent optimistic planning is no longer based on reasonable or supportable assumptions? We have no guidance in the IFRS to this topic, and so we cannot conclude on on some error. This would lead to second guessing of the enforcer. So there is no proof that the estimates and assumptions are not reasonable and supportable. We can only state some erroneous uh, or falsificate accounts if, if the preparer uses inconsistent or not plausible assumptions or the methodology is incorrectly applied. There is and should be no second guessing by the enforcer. So enforcement of financial reporting can only be as effective as the IRF standard allows. In our view, IR 36 is not sufficiently clear to enforce more meaningful cash flow protections. We recommend therefore more guidance be given regarding these cash flow protections. Deriving fair value is an 
is defined as an objective process. So it should be uh, someone uh, easy to, to examine this process. But in practice, at CGU level, we have no market data. So it can only be determined through subjective assumptions, which are also influenced by management objectives. And these fair value in the context of IFRS is therefore a little bit optimistic and shows an hockey, hockey stick effect in a lot of cases, I must admit. And so it's often shaped by company specific objective. So therefore it is questionable whether this definition of fair value in the context of the standard is met. So is there really a fair value reached? Furthermore, the terminal value in most basis or is the highest cash flow in the last period of the detailed planning period. So this is not only a so-called steady state cash flow. And in our opinion, this does not reflect real life experience about perhaps business cycles. So we have this steady going up cash flows, but no business cycle. So it should be also noted that the long-term risk rate should be consistent applied with the growth rate in the terminal value. So we have a very low interest rate, base rate, and our inflation is determined to be quite high. This does not correspond at all. So we therefore recommend requirement to use an average amount based on the detailed planning period for calculating terminal value and to look at the growth rates. Furthermore, we have experienced some goodwill allocation problems as EFRAC discovered also. We see a strong tendency for companies to allocate goodwill to the highest level possible. And so we have some shielding effect. And if the management states that the goodwill is not monitored for internal purposes on a lower level, so it's, it's fine for us and we, we couldn't do anything about. It's fine. It's like the standard tells us. We therefore would recommend changing the, the re requirement in paragraph 80 of IRS 36 and that the lowest level which an entity uh, monitors goodwill, uh, that it can be monitored, not only monitored to the COGM. So perhaps this would lead to some better allocation of goodwill. This is from my statement and I hand it over to Olivier. You are on mute. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, so <clears throat> Regarding the, the polling questions, uh, on the previous one, for technical reasons, we were unable to project the, the results, but I can read them to you. Um, so the question was, uh, which of the following would provide more discipline in, in relation to being over-optimistic by management? And so uh, you had five options. For response A, uh, we have 24% disclose how actual cash flows differ from management previous cash flows predictions. So that's the backtesting approach, 24%. 10% are in the B camp, improve information on, on assumptions related to the period from which management has projected cash flows, and especially on terminal values. Only 3% disclose the current level of cash flows to allow users to model themselves. Uh, we have 34% that believes that can be all of the above, and 29% that believes that none of them are feasible and practical. So um, to summarize, I would say that we, we have two-thirds that believe that there, there can be some information that can be provided around cash flows and, 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 and disclosures. Um, and only one-third that believes that uh, none, none, of, uh, none of them or practical or feasible. <clears throat> so um, we have um, the last um, polling question that has appeared on your screen. 
uh, for this uh, session. Could the ISBs propose disclosures on the subsequent performance of an acquisition help to better identify triggering events for a potential impairment of goodwill? So yes, uh, I'm sorry, uh, A, yes, such disclosure could help in identifying triggering events. B, yes, such disclosure could help in identifying triggering events, but they should not be required, for example, for confidentiality reasons. Or C, no, that wouldn't help, as they have been designed for another purpose and independently from the book value of goodwill. So take a few seconds, please um, respond. Um, uh, it is also time to take <coughs> questions uh, from the participants. Uh, if you have any that uh, on on that um, on that topic, um, so I see one. I can see one question that has been asked. Um, estimates. Are and should be optimistic because managers are and should be optimists. They should believe in what they are doing and in their strategy. Is there a conflict of interest in goodwill impairment tests and management motivations? <laughs> um, good question. So, um, who would like to? Uh, is there any volunteer to, to take up that question? So, Olivier, see, I, I'm Emmanuel. Yes, Emmanuel. I, I was thinking of you. <laughs> yeah, no, but because I, I think that uh, I see that uh, probably here the role should be of uh, independent uh, board member. I see in the latest years uh, that uh, they are more, uh, they participate uh, more uh, to the conversation and the challenge and they try to challenge the management. So uh, I, I think that uh, is, uh, is a sort of trade-off between uh, the two components, uh, the, the top management, but the other board member should be more uh, um, react to the over optimistic and try to challenge and uh, probably uh, more and more that they enter in confidence with uh, this uh, this mechanism it should be a, a good guarantee on that i don't know if uh, also auditors see this improvement in terms of uh, uh, sensibility and the feeling with uh, impairment test procedures Okay, uh, thank you, Emanuele. Uh, any other reactions to that question? No? Um, okay, then um, relating to, uh, then in that case, I can provide you with the responses that we've got for the last polling question. Uh, so, uh, could the ISB Proposed disclosures on the subsequent performance of an acquisition help to better identify triggering events. So um, we have 50% that believes that yes, such disclosure could help in identifying triggering events, and 44% that say no, that shouldn't, that wouldn't help um, as it has been designed for another purpose. Um, so we need two camps in, in on that question. Um, before we move on, I don't see any other questions. So in the interest of time, I suggest that we move on to our uh, third topic, and I turn it back to you, Tim. Thanks, Olivia. Uh, uh, yeah, so can we move on one more slide from there, please? Perfect. Thanks. Uh, so the other feedback from stakeholders during the post-implementation review was that the impairment test is costly and complex to perform. Hence, the ISB considered whether there were ways of reducing the cost of performing the impairment test without significantly impacting its robustness. And that's discussed on this slide. One of the reasons given for the cost of the test by companies is the requirement to perform the test even when there's no indication of impairment. 
The ISP's preliminary view is that it should remove the requirement to perform a quantitative test annually. However, companies would still need to assess at each reporting date whether there's an indication of impairment, and if such indication exists, the company would have to perform the quantitative test. This change should reduce costs for companies. However, there are mixed views on the extent of this reduction. And there are also mixed views on the impact this would have on the robustness of the test. Some believe this introduces further judgment into the test and that not performing the test regularly could result in a decline in the expertise with which companies perform this test. And some also believe an indicator-based test should be introduced only if amortization is reintroduced. This was another preliminary view where the ISB's majority was narrow. The majority, however, considered the reduction in cost significant, which would help offset some of the costs of providing the new disclosures, and the reduction in the robustness of the test marginal. Performing the test when there's no indication of impairment is unlikely to identify a material impairment and would provide little information to users of financial statements. And performing the test every year cannot solve the shielding issue, for, for example. Early feedback on the ISP's preliminary view and its impact on the robustness of the test is mixed. Although some stakeholders agree with the ISP's preliminary view that it's unlikely that a material impairment could occur without there being an indicator of impairment, some are concerned that companies will find it easier to avoid an impairment if a quantitative test is only performed when there's an indication of impairment. The ISP certainly wants to hear stakeholders' views on this topic in particular, specific examples where stakeholders might consider there to be additional judgments that companies make when assessing for indications of impairment compared to when companies determine the assumptions for a quantitative impairment test, or where those judgments made by companies are harder uh, for auditors to challenge. Because, for example, isn't the judgment that a competitor's new product launch is not an indication of impairment the same judgment that a competitor's new product launch doesn't have a significant impact on the assumptions for sales volumes and sales prices that are used in a quantitative impairment test. So uh, I think the board would be really interested in stakeholders' views on, that, on this particular topic. Um, so that covers this part of the ISP's preliminary review. So I'll hand back to you, uh, Olivia. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Tim. Uh, Catherine, so what are the preliminary views of AFRAG? In its draft comment letter, EFRA concurs that there is a potential to achieve cost savings in adopting an indicator-only approach. However, um, EFRA has reservations on the ISB proposal to remove the requirement to perform an annual impairment test. EFRA is uh, concerned about the robustness of such tests. An impairment test is a complex process. If companies do not perform an impairment test regularly, their expertise in performing the test is likely to decline. Another concern is management over-optimism. Um, the problem of management over-optimism, um, or the management could be uh, too optimistic, um, optimistic, and the auditor and the regulator um, does not have have the ability to compare the previous impairment test with the current impairment test. So it um, might increase the problem of management uh, over optimism. Um, EFRA clearly notes that there are cases where it is obvious already from the indicator analysis that there is no need for impairment and as such the detailed calculation would not add useful information to assess the recoverability uh, of the carrying amount. In these cases, EFRA believes that an indicator-only approach may play a role and the ISB could consider leveraging on what uh, is already in IAS 36, paragraph 99. So um, an indicator-only approach might, however, rely in a lower reliance by users on the results of the impairment test. This could potentially um, accentuate the too little, too late issue and could result in a further loss of information on governance and management stewardship of capital employed. If I could be concerned that the 
this could further reduce the effectiveness of the impairment test and uh, the confidence on the reliability of the test. So with these, I would like to hand over um, to you. Uh, or before, I would like to say that um, um, EFRAC um, ask the constituents whether they agree with this view um, that we were providing in the draft comment letter. And with these, I would like to hand over back to you, Olivier. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so um, now I'm going to ask Anne, Jenny, as um, as a professor, what, what, are, what do we know from the academics on, on that topic? Uh, thank you, Olivier. So I will try to, to give you a, a short uh, review of, um, of uh, the prior empirical evidence from, from academics. Um, so first, the, the research shows that, uh, that goodwill impairment is really an important component of the financial reporting process. So when I say goodwill impairment, so the, the way goodwill impairment test is, uh, is done and disclosed under IAS 36 and on an annual basis. And research also shows that um, information content of goodwill impairment is useful for uh, financial statement users. Uh, first, because the market reacts negatively to the revelation of such losses, so there is a, a, a clear reaction from financial markets. We also know that following an impairment loss announcement, um, firms also experience lower analyst forecast accuracy and higher analyst forecast dispersion. So. Uh, these are, also, again, uh, evidence of, uh, of the usefulness of, of, this, um, of this disclosure. Uh, third, we know that prospective information disclosed on goodwill impairment are negatively associated with cost of equity. So it also has an impact on, on the financing side of, of, for the company. And in a recent study, um, we show that the level of disclosure transparency uh, decreases disagreement among analysts and between analyst and manager about um, uh, the impairment of goodwill. So, so the more the, the more you disclosed in 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 the financial statements, the less there will be disagreement uh, among analysts about um, the earning forecast. Um, so I think that from from research side we can we can say that disclosure about goodwill impairment test is a means of improving disclosure <clears throat> of information on acquisitions, and I also think um, that the fact that the impairment test is carried out annually has the advantage of informing about the valuation trend of the goodwill which makes it possible to users to see if there is an opportunistic use. So it will be easier to see if there is an opportunistic use of the impairment of goodwill if, <clears throat> if we have um, um, a point of observation every year and, and, and if we can follow the trend of the cash flow forecast and the forward-looking information that is disclosed. And I think that in that sense, research is really joining uh, AFRAG first views on, on the indicator on the approach. Um, and and um, as a last point, I would recall what um, Martin said at, at the very beginning, that IAS 36, I, as I think, as a virtue of linking the publication of financial information with the company, with the company underlying strategy, and 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 this is something that 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 makes sense and and is important. And <clears throat> that's all. So I leave you the floor, Olivier. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, I'm going to turn it uh, right away to Leo. Leo, are you sharing Efrag's concerns on the proposal? Thanks, Olivier, and um, I, I, I would agree that the, that the indicator-only approach uh, would, of course, save costs, right, and would make it more practical. Uh, but of course, it will also exacerbate the issues we've before we've we've discussed before on this this webinar uh, about, for example, over optimism and, and and the subjectivity of the goodwill impairment test. Um, 
So if the board goes for this approach of ind indicator only, um, then it's really important that um, the indicators are robust enough to uh, to be first of all verifiable, but also to uh, lead to the desired uh, outcome. And to the extent there's still concern, uh, may one of the one of the things you, the board may cons may consider is to say, um, okay, the default would be that you do the uh, that you do an annual impairment uh, test uh, unless any of the following indicators would identify a situation where it is remote that such an impairment test would lead to uh, to an actual impairment loss. So uh, almost turning the turning the indicator approach around and and uh, bring more uh, robustness uh, to uh, to it. Um, so w with that, um, um, and the other the other thing is uh, also here it may help uh, the, the kind of disclosures around, um, uh, for example, the market cap versus the uh, the value of uh, CGUs, uh, where you you test management op um, um, ass assumptions and the estimates uh, against the market uh, estimates. So very briefly, Olivier, back to you uh, on on this topic. Thank you, Leo. Um, so let's have the view from uh, uh, a preparer on that topic, Emanuele. Uh, what is your view on indicator on the approach or annual don't test? Yeah, indicator is, um, I think that probably indicator should be uh, useful uh, for acquisition that you perform in, uh, in in the past and long time, uh, long time, because uh, probably uh, the the um, the idea that we enter in this uh, new accounting principle in uh, 25, uh, and uh, now we have uh, a lot of uh, acquisition already performed, and uh, even if they they went uh, well, uh, we are obliged uh, to reperform in permanent test for all of that. And so uh, this uh, should be a problem. So I don't see indicator for something big or uh, very, uh, very uh, close uh, to the period, the financial period, but probably for the past uh, and uh, with uh, a very uh, huge amount of recovery value, it should be a solution. Thank you, Emanuele. Um, Javier, as a user, any view on, on that? Yes, just uh, regarding um, some participants have mentioned the, the market cap and when there's this um, huge gap between the, the value of the, of the company and the market cap. And uh, my experience is that uh, top management tends to be quite uh, impervious to, to that. They, they, whenever that situation uh, happen, um, management would, would just say that the market didn't get the, the equity story, that the situation will turn around, uh, and they will then try to uh, basically work the, no the numbers to, to justify. So the problem with the, with the market cap is that even though the market is sending the signal to top management and to shareholders that something's wrong with the company, uh, there are certain top management that uh, are quite deaf at, the, at the receiving the, the message. So unfortunately, the, at least from my experience, the um, uh, relationship between the, the value of the assets and the market cap does not work in the sense of forcing management to uh, face reality. Uh, thank you, Javier. Uh, so, Robert, as an enforcer, um, uh, would you favor this uh, type of approach? Uh, we do not think that the board should follow this proposal. We have, as FRAP or as a regulator, discussions with management about the need to perform an impairment test for property, plant, and equipment. And so, whether there is an impairment trigger or not, so if we have an indication or not. We are convinced that enlarging the scope of management judgment further by linking this quantitative information or, or not doing this imp impairment test to judgmental indicators for impairment, will it, will it make easier to, to avoid recognizing goodwill impairment? So it's 
It's a contradiction for us. In addition, considering the goodwill positions in companies' balance sheet have already significantly increased over the last few years, we are concerned that the proposed removal of the requirement to perform a quantitative impairment test every year will further contribute to this trend. In our opinion, this loss in robustness of the goodwill impairment test cannot be outweighed by cost saved. So it's our clear statement. Um, thank you very much, uh, Robert. Uh, last but not least, uh, Diana, um, as a member of the IVSC board, um, what is your, your view on, on this topic? Well, our, as I've already mentioned when we were discussing the impairment as improvement alternatives, uh, the boards have uh, extensively discussed uh, the impairment risk issues. So, um, in our view, the current impairment uh, definitions and triggers are rather broadly um, outlined, and um, we would have recommended that uh, these triggers are more directly tied to the same KPIs and criteria and disclosures made at the acquisition date. So um, it, it has to do both with their uh, disclosures related to acquisition metrics and to impairment metrics, you know. So um, the same, uh, we, I, we believe that it's not that costly to uh, define more specific KPIs and cr criterias. Um, well, for example, the expected internal rate of return of the acquisition could be, could be compared to the company's cost of capital. There could be other implied uh, multiples uh, of, uh, say, sales, EBITDA, whatever is um, relevant for this asset, uh, which would both uh, um, compare the uh, performance of the target uh, to, to its uh, acquisition date, to its peers, and it could be a good indicator uh, for, for, um, for an impairment trigger. Now, uh, w with regards to compare, so uh, our view is that the impairment triggers need to be more balanced. They should be both externally oriented and they should also cover certain internal KPIs, especially in this current volatile market environment where there is a big discussion about uh, the gap between fundamental value and the market cap, where we see that the market cap is driven uh, quite uh, often by um, monetary policies of uh, um, regulators and financial, financial regulators than fundamentals of companies. We believe that this balanced approach with regards to the specification of the triggers could be a good way forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Diana. Um, so uh, you have on your screen um, our Polling question relating to indicator only approach. So, uh, if you could take a few seconds to, to respond. Um, so, uh, answer yes, it would reduce complexity and would allow cost savings for preparers by reducing the frequency of the test without making the test significantly less robust. No, the problem of management being too optimistic could be increased as auditors or regulators have no comparison to impairment tests prepared in previous years. Or no, because um, while the complex test uh, uh, would become significantly less robust if companies do not perform an impairment test regularly. Uh, and response D, no for both reasons given in B and C. So take a few seconds, and while you're responding, um, I'm checking whether we have questions from the participants. Uh, yes, there is. Uh, there are a couple. Um, so first question, is there a risk of postponing even more the recognition of an impairment if the annual impairment test is relieved? We see impairments even when there was no obvious trigger for impairment test. Uh, and maybe you can, uh, so it, uh, it can take 
question too as well. Has there been has there been uh, uh, an assessment whether there should be it should be required to allocate goodwill to different components or part of goodwill? Such components could be the difference between fair value and nominal value of different tax on tangent assets. Uh, and so on. So, um, so one one question is about uh, whether uh, the proposal would uh, allow to address the too little, too late problem. In fact, um, and the other one is about the level at which uh, whether we can make the test at a lower level. Um, uh, who would like to to respond to that uh, to those two questions? Uh, yeah, I'm Emmanuel Oliver. Yes. I think that uh, I mean uh, almost depends uh, on on trigger. So if trigger is a point in time, uh, probably uh, is not the answer for the first question. Is not. I mean, uh, if you have, uh, if you are in arrear uh, in budget, uh, or you have uh, a huge decrease of uh, market value, probably the trigger is uh, is uh, is on, uh, and so you have to enter quickly in impairment test. Uh, for sure, and uh, and uh, so it uh, depends a lot for which kind of trigger you 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 put, and what you follow strictly. And probably this is also a solution uh, to uh, avoid or uh, to, to avoid optimistic. So uh, try to, to choose a trigger point in time and not uh, forward looking. Uh, thank you, Emanuele. Uh, Tim? Thanks, Olivia. Uh, yeah, I mean, just, just a couple of comments and, uh, and, and looking at this question as well, and a couple of comments on uh, what the panelists have said. Um, so on triggers, actually, the board hasn't specifically thought about uh, whether it needs to um, change the impairment triggers if it did go to an indicator base test. That's something that's something that it will do in the second phase of this project. And certainly, as, as been mentioned before, actually the disclosures that we talked about earlier on subsequent performance that may well be quite a good trigger, as it were, because if a company is not meeting its objectives, um, the, the business combination is not meeting its objectives, then that could be a good indication of impairment. I mean, I think in terms of uh, the, the first question, I mean, that that's, that is different to what the board thinks. The, the board thinks that it's unlikely a material impairment could happen without there being an indication of impairment that a company uh, would be able to identify. So I think the board would appreciate I think feedback on that uh, and uh, some examples of where that might happen. And I think just generally I'd go back, I, I know in terms of, uh, you're, you're talking about the polling question in, in a moment, uh, but in terms of some of the comments from the panelists and the, the reservations about going to this approach, I think what the board would really appreciate is, again, some specific feedback on where uh, stakeholders think actually there will be more judgment if it if the board goes down this route, or the, those judgments are harder to challenge, because as I said in the setup, um, you know, if if a competitor has just launched a product and you make the assessment that that is not an indicator of impairment, then if you're doing a quantitative test, the company is making the same assessment that that is not impacting the assumptions that the company is going to be using in that quantitative test. So I'm just I'm just wondering where is the additional judgment, but also it'd be really interesting to hear if if actually the the those judgments are easier to challenge in a quantitative test than they are in the indicator based test. Thanks, Olivia. Uh, thank you, Tim. So the results of uh, the last question, whether uh, participants are in favor of indicator on the approach, 60% uh, believe that no, uh, the, that they are not supporting the, uh, the approach uh, for both reasons. Uh, so there is a uh, yeah, strong majority against, uh, against that proposal. Uh, I'm conscious that we are a bit behind schedule, so um, uh, I suggest that we move on to our next session on amortization, and Tim, uh, the floor is yours uh, for this next uh, session. 
Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Uh, so, in the post implementation review, several stakeholders said that the ISP should reconsider amortisation of goodwill. And since amortisation provides a simple mechanism that does target the goodwill directly, the ISP explored whether amortisation of goodwill should be reintroduced. And this slide lists some of the arguments for amortisation and some of the arguments for the impairment only approach that stakeholders put forward. And the discussion paper contains a fuller discussion of the arguments for both approaches. And firstly, just a point of clarification, when we're talking about the reintroduction of amortisation, this would be with an impairment test as well. So those stakeholders in favour of amortisation argue that the post-implementation review has demonstrated that the impairment test is not as rigorous as the ISB expected and does not provide as much information as the ISB expected because the shielding carrying amounts of goodwill can be overstated and so the test does not hold management to account and they argue that an amortisation expense in the income statement would hold management to account, reporting companies as profitable only if they generate enough profit to cover that expense. Some argue that goodwill is a wasting asset and amortisation is the only way to show the consumption of that goodwill and to prevent internally generated goodwill being recognised in the place of acquired goodwill as it's consumed. Although it's hard to estimate the useful life of goodwill, some argue this is no harder to estimate than for other assets. And some argue that amortisation takes pressure off the impairment test and ultimately reduces the cost of performing the test. On the other hand, stakeholders in favour of the impairment only approach argue that the impairment test provides more useful information than an arbitrary amortisation expense. Although often only confirmatory, they say it's still more useful than an amortisation expense that most investors would ignore. And unexpected impairment losses do occur and can have a significant effect on a company's share price. They argue that the impairment test is working as expected. The objective of the impairment test is to ensure the combined carrying amounts of cash generating units containing goodwill are not higher than their combined recoverable amount. And if applied well, the test meets that objective. And also when developing IFRS 3, the ISP was aware of shielding, but concluded then that the test was still rigorous. Some argue that goodwill is not a wasting asset with a determinable finite life. Companies acquire businesses with an expectation that the acquired goodwill is maintained indefinitely. And some argue that even if goodwill is am amortised, an impairment test would still be required and, and amortisation would therefore not significantly reduce cost. So if we can move on to the next slide, please. Um, the ISP's preliminary view that it should retain the impairment only approach was by a narrow majority. The ISP was, like stakeholders, quite split on this topic. However, this preliminary view reflects the majority view that there's no compelling evidence changing back to an amortisation model would be a significant improvement. Now, this isn't simply about which model is better, but whether there's compelling evidence that a change is needed. Given the narrow vote, the ISB welcomes feedback on the topic from stakeholders. However, just repeating well-known arguments will not necessarily move the debate forward. And instead, the ISB welcomes feedback that provides new evidence or arguments, or perhaps reasons why previous arguments are now more relevant. Okay, thanks, Olivia. Thank you, Tim. Um, so now I turn it to um, Catherine for uh, reactions from uh, the uh, EFRAG. I think uh, it's Kara. Yes, uh, I will be brief also in considering the timing. Uh, um, our comments letter doesn't have uh, a view. Uh, EFRAG has not yet for formed a view at the beginning of this consultation on amortization or not. Certainly not because we are short of arguments, on the contrary. Uh, uh, we have seen the team showed the key uh, points of this debate uh, and we have in our comment letter an entire catalogue of conceptual arguments uh, in both the directions that come from uh, research done by EFRAG in the past as well as also from our academic uh, uh, panel. So from a conceptual point of view there seems to be really no, uh, no clear answer um, and uh, uh, similarly to the ISB, also our tag and our board was divided and also the preliminary feedback from uh, the consultative forum of European standard setters seems to show that not even among jurisdictions but also in the, in the same jurisdictions between uh, stakeholders 
others there are different views so if we cannot go out from a conceptual point of view some suggest to go for a practical approach and to consider amortization for, on a practical ground something that also team uh, considered so in conclusion this page page 29 uh, 28 shows the key questions that we have in our uh, comment letter on uh, uh, whether the amortization should be reconsidered or not. The main point is to get new evidence and to understand why it's now the right moment to undertake such a big change. The other question is whether a goodwill is wasting asset or not. Um, whether goodwill is an accounting construct, so from a conceptual point of view, it doesn't matter if it's amortized or not, the users will always strip that component out. Uh, whether the goodwill should be separated into components, something that was also coming from one of the questions from, from the audience before, so identify the components that have clearly a limited life and amortize only those, uh, and whether it's useful uh, for users and, prepare, uh, and feasible for preparers to provide information about the age of the goodwill if the information is not introduced, just to provide more information compared to what we get now. That's it. Thank you, Chiara. So um, now for that last session, I'd like to ask um, uh, Leo for his view as, as auditor on amortization versus um, uh, non-amortization. Thanks, Olivier. And um, I mean, I've been long enough in this business to have uh, seen standard setters move back and forth between amortization and non-amortization. I mean, I've lost some hair on in the meantime, um, and even deductions from equity straight away. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. Sorry, I'm, I'm not hopeful, Tim, that uh, anything new will come up in terms of conceptual arguments uh, 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 after 50 years of discussion on on the topic. Um, however, uh, so I'll, I'll just be. I'll, I'll just mention a few practical issues here. <clears throat> from an author's perspective. So first of all, uh, if you introduce amortization, of course, that will make it more practicable in, in the sense that it will take off the pressure from the issues that we've discussed earlier in this webinar. Uh, it will not take them away. It will it'll just make them less profound. But it will also create arbitrariness in terms of the amortization period. Um, and in, in our experience, uh, investors tend to just ignore the, the amortization amount of goodwill. So the, the the information value of that number m might not be great, but uh, but uh, I mean people differ in in, in views on that. Uh, the only other point I wanted to make, uh, Olivier, is um, uh, of course the goodwill impairment test under IFRS and US GAAP is not the same, um, but at least the uh, capitalization and non-amortization of goodwill is currently under IFRS and US GAAP the same. And we know that the FASB has also opened the discussion. So one of the considerations uh, or one of the maybe recommendations, uh, and I hope that the board will, will look at that, is to talk to, the, to your counterparts at the other side of the pond to um, at least uh, uh, check where there can be a level playing field in the merger and acquisition market because the non the amortization or not of goodwill is is seen by many as as a potential um, uh, issue in terms of level playing field in the m a market so back to, back to you uh, olivier uh, thank you leo uh, i think it would be interesting to hear anne as uh, to, to understand what is the economics view on, on that topic Okay, Olivier. Um, so I, I think that that it, it goes back to to the to the, to the question of um, of of the, the underlying question of what is the nature of goodwill? Is it a, is it an asset with a with a definite useful life or not? And we have some some evidence provided by uh, by papers that goodwill is priced as an asset because there is a positive association between um, equity market values and reported goodwill assets, but um, with a lower valuation multiple than for other assets. And we also know that markets um, distinguish to some degree between valuable and worthless uh, goodwill portions. 
But at the same time, there are some evidence that value relevance uh, of goodwill, so value relevance is uh, the fact that it is um, priced by financial statement user. So the value relevance of goodwill has really increased after the adoption of IFRS and the implementation of goodwill impairment tests. So it, it is really much more value relevant than at the time of amortization. And we also know that um, goodwill amortization understates the goodwill value decline as it could be perceived by, by stock markets. So um, going back to amortization of goodwill, to my point of view, would bring uh, three, three risks. Uh, so first, um, I don't know what would be the economic meaning of goodwill amortization, and especially if we go back um, to an, arbit um, an arbitrarily uh, linear um, rate of amortization. And there is also the risk of disappearance of impairment of goodwill if it is already amortized. Uh, the second risk is um, the question of the duration. So we will have a lot of discussion about how long will the goodwill be amortized, and this will lead to new areas of debate and new areas of judgment. And the third risk is the one of losing a lot of useful information about the underlying business of a company. Since IR36 requires high level of mandatory disclosure that have proven to be quite useful for financial statement users. So, so this, is, uh, this is my academic point of view on, on this point. Thank, Thank you. you. Anne. Thank you very much, Anne. Uh, and I think it would be good to complement that view with um, uh, Diana's view, uh, as I'm conscious that the IVSC has uh, has expressed and, uh, and has issued a paper on that topic. Diana? Uh, thank you, Olivier. Uh, yes, um, just following up on what just Anne said, uh, the IVSC has explored the nature of goodwill. And while, our, you know, um, it is subsuming assets uh, which do not meet the criteria of being identified as separate, uh, we still believe that goodwill uh, is a, contains uh, important assets which are not wasting in nature. And just a few examples, that's the company reputation, the going concern value, the assemblage value, the workforce, which is becoming more and more important assets these days. So um, the uh, board was probably uh, quite unanimous here in, uh, well, uh, if you read the paper, we have also provided some uh, practical examples uh, demonstrating this view, uh, is uh, that goodwill is not a waste, uh, wasting asset and any amortization would not be uh, based on uh, a sound understanding of the uh, useful life and would that not be very helpful in understanding the value creation uh, of the company. Thank you. I have to be very bright. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Diana. Uh, so you have on your screen um, a question on uh, whether you think that uh, amortization of goodwill should be reintroduced. Uh, so, A, yes for conceptual reasons, B, uh, yes for practical reasons, or no for um, conceptual reasons, uh, and, or no as there is no sufficient evidence that uh, a major change is needed. Uh, so uh, please, um, uh, uh, that's the, the last opportunity to express your, your view on, <coughs> on that topic. Um, uh, while you are responding, I'd like to uh, have the view of Robert as an uh, enforcer. Yeah. As an enforcer, we do not agree with the board that the impairment only approach should be retained. We, we think that is from a academic point of view, the right concept, but in practice it has proven that is not applied well. So in practice, the last 15 years has proven to be a, a little bit of failure or uh, deliver not the correct figures. 
So even if goodwill is not a wasted asset, which we believe, uh, therefore impairment only is the ter theoretical model, but the current impairment model has failed to produce timely and significant impairment. So we are convinced that the increasing goodwill positions in the balance sheets are a threat for the whole economic system to, to allocate capital or in, in the wrong manner and so on. And at this point, we should do a amortization approach so that this problem is getting a little bit smaller. But we know there are some other areas of debate, like the useful life or something of goodwill amortization. So it is not easy. But in our view, there should be the amortization approach for goodwill. Um, thank you very much, Robert. Um, so back to the polling questions. Uh, you've been very quick to respond to, the, to, to that one. Um, uh, interesting to see that uh, people have strong views in, uh, on, on that. So uh, you've been uh, more than 80% to say yes, either for conceptual or practical reasons. Um, and only, uh, only well, the, the remaining uh, 15, 16 percent uh, know either for conceptual or no sufficient evidence. But no sufficient evidence, uh, it's only 3 percent. Uh, so uh, I would have expected, in fact, a more balanced, uh, uh, more balanced responses between yes and no. And in that case, it's, it's clearly a, a yes uh, for 80 percent. Uh, so let's continue with our panel, and I'd like to have now the view of um, uh, Javier as, as a user. Uh, does it uh, have any value relevance to you uh, to have impairment uh, uh, amortization expenses, Javier? Uh, yes, and that is uh, the reason is um, the evolution of, the, of some of the trends that we are witnessing. For example because of uh, digitalization and new business models, the, the intangible part of the assets that a company uh, has are, are going to increase. And so it's the importance of goodwill in any M&A uh, operation. So if the goodwill is becoming more important, and if I believe that the impairment test does not work because of uh, internal conflicts of interest, then, uh, the solution, which is, I, I, I reckon, is not perfect. I, I reckon that bringing back amortization is going to uh, uh, cause some disruption, and there's going to, and some, uh, most are going to pay for the sins of the few. But the problem of those sins is that when they happen, they uh, they um, generate a, a significant amount of economic uh, uh, damage. So I want the amortization of the goodwill to come back to have a buffer system built. So if um, uh, the management of a company goes into a, a acquisition spree, they have to pay it forward instead of relying on, let's put it this way, playing the system with the impairment test. So I prefer, that's why I favor the amortization of goodwill coming back, being restated. You're on mute, Olivier. Thank you, Javier. Let's hear Emmanuel's view as as a, as, as a user. What what do you think, Emmanuel? Yeah, I think uh, as user, as preparers, probably is uh, is uh, is useful uh, and uh, easy to reintroduce uh, amortization, considering uh, that uh, we clean up uh, very quickly or or we click up during the time uh, the, the balance sheet. But then uh, the introduction of amortization uh, put uh, a lot of questions that uh, today is difficult uh, to, to, to answer in terms of, uh, time, of uh, time of amortization, necessity of an impairment test, uh, even, uh, even in case of amortization, because, uh, I mean, uh, Usually, when you enter in amortization, we don't care 
of the value during uh, the period or uh, the attention uh, is uh, is lower and so uh, this put uh, probably on the in the same level good acquisition and uh, worse acquisition so is is not uh, we we have uh, the same treatment for 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 for, uh, for different acquisition and uh, different stories and probably without uh, another or a further impairment test uh, is difficult to differentiate successful uh, uh, deal compared to to, to not uh, uh, Please consider also that, uh, I mean, uh, in uh, some uh, situations such as banks, uh, amortization, uh, goodwill is already deducted by, by regulatory capital. But it means uh, that probably amortization uh, is only something that affects uh, the profitability and the potential uh, uh, dividend distribution of the banks, uh, of the institution. And so probably the single amortization uh, should be uh, a stop uh, to M&A or to perform a new acquisition because probably it's, uh, with amortization the, the return on uh, the, the equity, the earning per shares and all KPIs should be suffer for that. And so we have to be careful on to introduce amortization uh, without uh, the whole uh, environment uh, clear. Thank you, Emanuele. Um, so uh, now I see that we have uh, a few questions from the participants. Um, and those questions primarily relate to, uh, well, if we were coming back to impairment, uh, the problem of, of the, the useful life. Um, Tim, I saw that you had uh, that you wanted to uh, to uh, to, ex to express views. Uh, would you like to react to that or to something else? Uh, I, I was just going to just uh, react to the polling question and, and just some of the comments from the panelists. Very brief. Very okay. Brief. Go, go ahead. Yeah. Tim. Yes. Uh, go ahead. So, I mean, I think, as I said, um, what the board's looking for is compelling evidence, whether there's um, a need for a, uh, a change and whether that change would be a significant improvement in financial reporting. Um, and we do hear that, you know, if amortisation was reintroduced, some say that companies are quite likely to add that back in the earnings they report to investors because they see it as not being particularly reflective of the economics of their business. And from many investors, we hear that they wouldn't find the amortization expense uh, that, that useful. So I guess the question here is, um, you know, why would that be a significant improvement to financial uh, re re reporting? Um, and I guess, um, and, and for those stakeholders who express that opinion, the board would really like to hear the views on on that and why it would be a significant improvement from some of the comments it does it does give the impression that actually amortization should be reintroduced because the test isn't working and we need something to get rid of goodwill and so the challenge then is well actually should the objective of the subsequent accounting for goodwill just solely be something that gets rid of it is that the right objective to have for the subsequent accounting for goodwill and so that's just something i think stakeholders should consider when they're considering this this perspective um that sorry olivia that was all i was just going to comment on oh, thank you very much tim so among the the comments that we received from the participants um there are more comments than questions uh but there is there is one on, on so on, on useful life uh, thinking that while well, maybe uh, it is as subjective, the, the, the problem of, the de of determining the, the useful life of goodwill is, uh, might be as subjective as it is for any other estimates needed for impairment tests. Uh, so it, it, it was a question, but maybe we can take that as, as a comment uh, from, from this participant. Uh, also, uh, there was um, uh, some comments reacting to the question as to whether there is new evidence uh, that would uh, push towards um, uh, coming back to an amortization. And, and the comments made uh, 
uh, seem to say, well, wh why are we saying that there is no evidence while uh, there, there seems to be some competing evidence, uh, especially when looking at uh, how fast business models are evolving, the environment is evolving, um, maybe also COVID-19 crisis uh, seems to provide new evidence as well. Um, and so, uh, and so there, there, there is uh, well, some, some disagreements expressed here on the fact that there is a lack of, of evidence. Um, I'm suggesting that in the interest of time that we close the session at that stage. Uh, and uh, Chiara, I turn it back to you. Thank you, uh, Olivier. I'm not sure we have the time for a good uh, recap of uh, the interesting messages that we have heard today. I think that the feedback broadly confirms the key points of the debate uh, and preliminary views of EFRAG. However, we also have uh, heard some interesting new perspectives. Uh, and uh, uh, we will issue a report, so we will have the occasion to think about what we have learned today. Let me perhaps just uh, thank the audience for the feedback, which provides a really useful input to our process. Um, remind that the preparers can still participate to our survey and that we wait for as many comment letters as possible until the end of November. Let me thank Olivier for moderating brilliantly this panel and the panelists for accepting to be with us and for their high quality contribution. I think we have heard strong and well supported views today from all of you. Thank, of course, to the ASB for joining forces uh, uh, on this uh, outreach program and stay tuned for the next events. And now the last word to you, uh, Martin. Okay, thanks, Kiera. I also want to say thank you very much to all of you for this interesting comments and also for the people on the webinar asking this kind of questions. For me, it was my to die, the days apart was more listening, but it was really, I thought when I, as a board member, had to answer all these kind of questions, I thought a little bit more interrelated. Because clearly you can have an opinion on amortization, yes or no, does it make a lot of conceptual sense? But for me, it was a whole package, because my, that was one of the last questions, is there new evidence from the post-implementation review? And that was, for me, at least the starting point, because people had said there is an issue with this kind of current accounting. And therefore, for me, the package is maybe improving disclosure. If we can't improve really the robustness of the impairment test, maybe disclosure is a solution. And I thought more interrelated, because I think we have an issue that was really demonstrated by the post-implementation review, and I see it all as a package, as an answer, how to overcome what evidence we got from the post-implementation review. Having that said, there is still time to think about that and giving us good comments back. As I said in the beginning, I think the comment deadline is end of this year, and hope we get all from you guys a lot of new comments and then the board can consider, okay, what we have heard and maybe rethink our preliminary views or confirm it. As again, thank you very much, all of you, for this contribution to this webinar and have all a good day. Thank you very much.